Big Tech's ordinance has everything from complete firearms to OEM and aftermarket parts. If you're looking to put together your first AR-15, they have everything from those parts that you need to the tools that are going to be essential. If you're looking for suppressors, night vision, handheld lights, weapon lights, sights or optics, you name it, Big Tech's has it all. Not only that, they're offering all those brands that we like. Go visit them at BigTechsOrdinance.com. Filster makes awesome holsters, but not only that, they also happen to be one of those companies that are trendsetters. A lot of their designs are emulated by other companies. Not only does Filster make those holsters, but they also provide concealment systems like the Enigma, the Flex. They also have a lot of solutions when it comes to concealment solutions for medical. If you need to have a concealment first aid kit, they happen to sell them. Check them out at filsterholster.com. Primary Arms Government now offers the comprehensive agency trade-in program, so professional teams can get the most from their used or obsolete equipment. Working with GTI's asset training program, Primary Arms Government can offer you top dollar on any agency asset. From service weapons to uniforms, tools, and vehicles, their agency program is the best way to grow your agency's budget and upgrade with America's leading tactical brands. For more information, please visit www.primaryarms.com government. Staccato, from everyday citizens to those in the line of duty. A staccato firearm is a promise of American ingenuity, precision engineered reliability, accuracy and confidence, because the better we shoot, the closer we are to the target, the more locked in we are for family and freedom. If you're ready to get to the next level with a 2011, start with staccato at staccato2011.com. Walther is the performance leader in the firearms industry, renowned throughout the world for its innovation since Carl Walther and his son Fritz created the first blowback semi-automatic pistol in 1908. Today, the innovative spirit builds off the invention of the concealed carry gun with the PPK series by creating the PPQ, PPS, and the Q5 match steel frame series. Military, police, and other government security groups in every country of the world have relied on the high-quality craftsmanship and rugged durability of Walther products. Walther continues its long tradition of technical expertise and innovation in the design and production of firearms. For more information, visit WalterArms.com. Hey, one Matt Lanfer here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. Today is February 27th, 2022. The episode number is 286. We're going to be talking about Ukraine, specifically Ukraine in February 2022. Um, who knows? We might have a follow on modcast discussing what happens next. So it's kind of important to have the date. And since we're at the end of the month, I don't need to put the day. Um, unreal watching what's happening on the news right now. Um, seeing all kinds of various reports, all kinds of different posts. Everything from possible reports to blatant memes. Um, it, I, I'm looking forward to this discussion. It's going to be really interesting. I'm, I have I have snacks and drink right over here, just so, so I can I, I can take some great mental notes and, and learn about learn better about where we've been, where we're going. So, my background's in law enforcement. Nothing military. Nothing. I have nothing to add with this other than. I've been in a, uh, I've been consuming media and who knows how much of that's even accurate. We're going to be talking a bit about what uh, events leading up to this, why it's happening uh, overall, what it means for Europe, what it means for the U S and also globally. Um, there's also a, a really interesting dynamic going on with misinformation and disinformation, how that's affecting the efforts and also public opinion. So we have a really cool panel for this we have more people coming on. Um, it's going to be a pretty open discussion, not very much direction. It's kind of go on. It's going to go on whatever tangents everyone wants to go on. Um, so from there, I think I'll throw it over to Chuck to do an intro. Yeah. Uh, Chuck P. I've been uh, following this since it started, obviously. Um, just kind of watching and fascination as, as this kind of all played out. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's what I got going on. And Yancey. Yancey Harrington, um, 
former army uh, back in the eighties uh, to the, to the mid nineties and the, and the reserve component sort of stuff. Uh, went to school over in Russia in 92, part of a university of Arizona program um, fell right into a job with an import company doing business over there, made bunches of trips over there, kind of went freelance back in 2003 um, working basically as a translator slash consultant for um companies wanting to do business in Russia. So I'm, I'm down to, well, we got one, one main client that I work with right now. And currently, uh, well, as of last week, anyway, uh, been buying, uh, ammunition out of, uh, the barn old carpet plant. So been glued to the computer phone, um, uh, since, uh, the thing kicked off on, uh, on Wednesday, uh, following closely and stuff. And, uh, yeah, I've got a little bit of stake in it, but, uh, I'm not taking sides on, on the, on this thing. I would like uh, everybody to go home and play nice. You know, <laughs> I don't know if that's realistic. Good deal. Andy, do you want to do an intro? It's up to you. Uh, hi, my name's Andy and I'm a surgery resident. And I'm in the ICU covering all the surgery and trauma ICU patients tonight. So I will chime in when I can, and I may sign off as needed. Yeah. Is that good? Oh, what absolutely. Um, w- with your mask on and just saying you're Andy, I don't know if anyone actually knows who you are. The, 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 the famous, the inf- infamous Andrew Fisher. <laughs> yes. And yes, I, like I said, I'm a surgery resident and, uh, I've been associated with you guys for, oh my goodness, probably five years now. It's been a uh, couple weeks. Yeah. I don't chime in too often as my schedule doesn't permit it, but, uh, yeah, I'm always here, always around. And Heck if yeah. anyone ever needs any insight into pre-hospital trauma care, I'm more than happy to help. Awesome. Thank you. I, am I getting it correct that you, you are going to be a learned doctor? Uh, <laughs> <such an> ass. <laughs> I, I am becoming a learned doctor. Yes. So, so, so your, your DX and the Papa alpha for the big Mike Delta is that, that's, that's what we got going on here. So I am, I am, see, I'm, I am Mike Delta now and uh, yeah. And I am about one third of the way through my uh, training as a, for surgery. Wow. Awesome, man. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Cool. So there was an interesting comment I, I read somewhere. Um, someone essentially said that this is going to be a shock because the world hasn't seen war portrayed like this. And I kind of thought about that a little bit. And I discussed it with my dad who served in the Marine Corps during Vietnam. And he said, well, wait a minute. We had embedded journalists and Vietnam was on 24 seven. And I said, yeah, it it was, but what's going on now is everyone has a cell phone and everyone can post video of anything they see at any time. We can have many feeds from the same thing, but at the same time, back in the Vietnam era, we probably had some more reputable reporters. Now we don't necessarily have that guarantee of freshness and goodness coming from, uh, 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 as far as the source is concerned. So there can be a lot of hell. I've seen a lot of uh, videos and pictures uh, shared being misrepresented um, things from from movies from years ago. Um, it's been very, very interesting to just watch everyone's feeds. Um, everything from the ghost to the. I wish I could remember the other one, the, the diver who was killing s- subs ships. That's what it was. Yeah. So. Uh, interesting, interesting how things are, are, are rolling out and how much, uh, how much attention it's getting. It's, I, I think that the diver one was more tongue in cheek than anything Oh, absolutely. Else. It's hilarious. Um, but, uh, it's, I, well, I remember, what was it? Uh, late, no, early 2000 CNN in Iraq or in the middle East constantly. That's all we had on TV. And now we have it oh, run the clock on uh, on the internet with even more angles and less bias. Very and at the same time, possibly a lot of bias. But just interesting time to be alive. Interesting to see how things have uh, evolved, which it actually it absolutely has. So, 
based on your guys' experience, knowing what's going on, what has been the relationship between Russia and Ukraine historically? As I said earlier, if I could interject this, Please. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, they, they have a, a very close relationship culturally, somewhat linguistically. Uh, Ukrainian language was pretty much uh, a, a dying language. And because of uh, Russia alienating themselves and Ukraine alienating themselves between each other, uh, there's actually been quite a revival in, in, in Ukrainian language. Uh, used to be all official business uh, with the government was in Russian. Uh, Russian was the only thing that was taught in, in universities. Um, everybody in Ukraine speaks, uh, uh, speaks Russian. But they 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 have a bit of an accent, like like they like we do here in the states. It's it's in the south, and whenever you hear them say certain certain words, for instance, the uh, whenever Ukrainians say "что" or uh, Russians say "что," which means "what," uh, Ukrainians say "что." So it's like you can tell right away that they're they're from that area. You know, they're from you know they're from Ukraine. Now, is that more of a remnant of the uh, Soviet era? Um, so quite a few of the Soviet leaders were, were Ukrainian, um, uh, crew, uh, it's a dude, it's a dude took over. I'm drawing a blank, man. <laughs> the guy that, uh, started the uh, Cuban missile crisis. What was his name? Um, I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry, guys, but he was Ukrainian. Uh, Gorbachev was from, uh, Crimea. So, uh, he he also spoke, you know, kind of kind of uh, kind of strangely. Let me uh, let me look something up real quick, guys. I'm sorry. Um, but Khrushchev, Khrushchev, the guy before Khrushchev. Okay. Uh, of course, I can't type shit either. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, Nikita. Yeah, it was Nikita Khrushchev. I'm sorry. You're right. Nikita, because I was thinking that he had like a, a KO on the last of his name, and that also signifies pretty much that they're Ukrainian. Interesting. And I think, yeah, he's uh, he he was he was he was Ukrainian. And what's interesting was back in the seventies, uh, Khrushchev, while he was the leader, uh, basically gave Crimea to the uh, Ukrainian uh, Soviet Republic. And it, from before that, it was part of the Russian uh, Soviet uh, Republic. And uh, so what's interesting about it is that about 94 percent of the population in Crimea is is are, are ethnic Russians and like three percent are Ukrainian and two percent are like Crimean Tatars. So whenever they annexed it back in. 14, basically they, they took, took over because they still had military bases there and they're paying the Ukrainians rent for it. But, um, well, that those rent payments came to a screeching halt back, back whenever, uh, the polite men in green suits showed up, you know, and, 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 and annexed it. I served an LDS mission in the former East Germany in 95 to 97 and met a lot of people that re, that I guess they were forced to relocate from Russia into uh, like East Berlin. Wonderful people, great people. Uh, food was excellent, but it was interesting to see and, and talking to the people that had, had grown up in the area, especially since uh, the, the Soviets took over, how Russian was taught as the, sec as the second language over there. German was first, Russian was second. English was if you're at a special school, yeah. So, Chuck, what do you have on this? Uh, I mean, as far as I, I don't, I don't, I don't like going down the road of like long term. Who, who shot Bob, uh, stuff like that. It's, it's kind of like arguing, uh, 
who the holy land belongs to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, Hey, the Jews just came out of nowhere in the, you know, after world war two and just took all mm-hmm. of our shit. Well, but the Jews had it back then and then they were enslaved and blah, 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 blah. At the end of the day, um, who has it now? Yeah. You've, you've got to, you have to understand that that's, that's always going to be a, a, a factor. And, um, when the Ukrainians chose self-rule, then, then that, that was it. It would be like us successfully winning the revolutionary war and then having to go back and fight the war of 1812 and whatever. Like at what point do you fucking get it? That self-determination matters. This needs to be a history lesson for elements of the United States, because when our inevitable divorce happens, there are going to be people using these exact same arguments to justify rolling tanks into your shit, even though 90% of the people where you live voted for self-determination. You need to understand that what we're seeing over there is what is coming here. Um, do, do you have the right to self-govern if you are the majority or not? And, uh, and what are people that don't agree with you going to do about it? Um, now let's, let's look at a bit, the bigger, the, the elephant in the room. Okay. Is Putin a communist? Is Putin an ultranationalist? Is Putin executing a long game that he has been thinking about in a closet since the Soviet union fell apart and he was the director of the KGB, um, does he want to rebuild the Soviet Union? These are the questions that, that we have to be kind of asking ourselves. And, and if, if any of the answers to those are yes, then why? Um, the, the elephant in the room that people are just now starting to talk about is that um, the Vladimir Putin that we are seeing today is not the Vladimir Putin that has been acting in world politics for the last 20 years. Nationalist Putin that found himself rising to power after the fall of the Soviet Union, I believe, enjoyed the gangster thug life of the oligarchy. He liked power. He liked money. That is why President Trump and Vladimir Putin were able to communicate so effectively. They're both populist narcissist thugs. And they understand each other. The art of the deal. There's no, there's no room for drama. Uh, and emotion when money's on the table. You got to stand, sit across from your opponent, man to man, and talk business. And so he was a businessman. The Putin that Condoleezza Rice knows, the Putin that George W. Bush knows, the Putin that Hillary Clinton and uh, President Obama dealt with. That is new age Putin, post fall of communist Russia Putin. Now we have new, new Putin who doesn't act anything like this gangster oligarch uh, billionaire uh, behind the scenes shadow governor for life uh, of, uh, of Russia. Um, and I believe that at the classified level, there are a lot of head shrinkers that are deep diving that right now. I did not know until the past week that essentially – uh, my man was a, a significant germaphobe, and he was more concerned about catching COVID than the British government was about protecting the Queen of England from catching COVID. He was anti-COVID to the next level. And for the past two years, he has essentially sequestered himself, and people that wanted a public audience with him had to go into quarantine for weeks and then be sprayed with chemicals before they could go into a public, uh, into a private meeting with him. When we look at this bleach white, large, huge rooms that he's having these meetings in and how far away he is standing off from other people. Uh, and then you look at his, uh, you know, manifesto that he said the other day. And then you look at uh, when the head of the foreign intelligence service got up to, to put his rubber stamp on this invasion. And the guy was so scared, he didn't even know what to say next. And Putin had to talk him through. We looked at his two generals that were sitting in the room. He ordered them to 
raise the nuclear alert level. Look at their faces. Look at the body language of everyone that is around this man in recent terms. They're terrified. Um, They're absolutely terrified. So I'm telling you that what I believe Chuck's non psychiatrist opinion is that my man had two years of isolation, much like Ted Kaczynski in his cabin losing his shit and becoming the Unabomber. I believe that that President Putin is suffering some, from some paranoid delusional shit from being by himself for hours each day and having these conversations in his head and basically crafting a narrative in his mind with no other input sources to, to talk at psychosis of, of a national level leader that has been isolated and left to his own thoughts for for, for a long time as a result of this COVID isolation. And this dude that, that we are witnessing now is absolutely unhinged. Um, and that this isn't some 20 year game where he's been suckering the entire world. And he's had this war plan since the fall of the Soviet union, that he's going to get the band back together. Um, it, it flies in the face of all of his success as an oligarch thug. Uh, why is he now willing to risk everything on a national, on an international stage uh, to, to go after th- this narrative that, that, that I believe that he's just come up with in his own head? He talked to his own demons in whatever sequestered palace he's been in for two years, and he convinced himself that this is the way the world is, man. And he's fucking nuts. That, that's that's, that's my, my opinion. Putin's lost his mind, and we're looking at we're, we're looking at a, at a deranged individual, not some type of ultranationalist strategy. Over. Oh, so we have a medical doctor here on the panel who also probably has seen people has seen how people have reacted to all the all the quarantines, the less social activity, the staying indoors, not going out. This makes it makes sense. Hell, my daughter, who's only 11, she doesn't want to go in public. Now, take it to times 10. I don't think we that makes a lot of the, sense. Yeah, I don't think we've seen the, the, um, kind of the overarching long-term effects of what this has caused uh, yeah. the past two years. And uh, I think we'll probably end up seeing this sort of, um, you know, if, if, if it is truly, you know, some sort of isolation uh, caused uh, issue, then I think it's going to be, yeah, years. We're going to be seeing these problems. So, And everyone, oh, hell, Putin's a man. He is a human. He is susceptible to this. All of us are at different levels. Interesting, interesting, good observations. It was like a one, it was, it was like a one, two, three blow that I just, I was sitting at home watching it. And I heard uh, French president Marcon talk about when he came back from the emergency meeting, like, Hey man, Putin's off. Like I ain't never seen my man acting like that. And then when he punked the SVD, uh, the director of the SVD in public, And the guy's like, he's just trying to say whatever he wants to say to not get his head cut off. And he's like, yeah, I totally am down with adding the two Ukrainian provinces to the the, uh, Russian Republic. And Putin had to be like, stop. We're talking about acknowledging the 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 breakaway republics we're, we're not talking about bring, making them part of russia right now like the svd chairman was just spitting shit out so fast that like what do you want me to say i'll say it i'll say it like it was just crazy that dynamic and that guy's like the equivalent of the cia director and, and he and he was he was on the on the hot seat and uh, and Putin's like, use your words, you, use the right words, talk about the right terminology. It was just insane. Uh, and then right before th- this, uh, I watched Condoleezza Rice uh, on um, Fox News, and she is a, a statesman of all statesmen, stateswoman, statesperson, whatever, whatever pronouns we're using today. C- Condi, uh, C- Condi was a voice of reason in, in a hawkish cabinet. Uh, immediately after 9-11 that was trying to do 
you know, t- take it all the way. Like, let's strike while the iron's hot. Who else has pissed us off? Let's put them on the target deck. And she was there during during all of that as, as a calm voice of reason, um, you know, with, with Secretary Powell. Uh, and, and Bush trusted her. Bush trusted her. And her comments about uh, President Putin's demeanor, and there was a text from... Um, um, uh, Mario, uh, uh, the Floridian who's on the intelligence committee. What's his name? Marco. Really? Sorry, Ru- Marco Rubio. Rubio basically said, well, I can't say much. Basically, wink, wink, nod, nod. I'm in classified briefings. And he on Twitter called out the sanity, uh, potential sanity and state of mind of, uh, of, uh, of Vladimir Putin. So this is multiple people all kind of in rapid succession saying this is the only uh, kind of explanation. Like even the full-blown let's take all of Ukraine and not just reinforce the breakaway republics, m- maybe some guys could get on board with that. But uh, we talk about sanctions and you bring the nuclear, your nuclear alert level to high, like everybody this generation X knows level. That's not a political tool. We, you don't scramble bombers during the Cold War and, and do things like that be, because of what is at risk. And so when he went full nuclear alert status, like right out of the gate, I think that's when everybody's like, whoa, this dude is not a rational, this isn't rational businessman let's make a deal cutthroat uh putin this is this is unhinged putin that 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 we're seeing and and so it's not chuck chuck in his isolated cabin on the mountain coming up to that that conclusion on his own i'm listening to people that that have been in a room with this dude like several several sources all saying that he ain't he ain't right he like he, he ain't right right now so that scares me. And that's why all these predictions about what comes next, whatever, you know, there's the meme about all your civilian friends as a veteran. Are we going to get a war? Is this world war three? Like that shit's funny. Cause it's true. But, but unlike uh, kind of previous times, my, my experience, my, anything that I have, you can't, you can't predict a, a, a madman. Uh, if, if he really is off his rocker, uh, I, I think, there is either going to be a, a billionaire oligarch funded uh, hit team type thing happen, or he's going to order some generals like launch the nukes now. And they're going to be like, man, fuck out of here. T- take them. And so I think we're looking at some type of internal power struggle because he's come that hard, that fast. Uh, I don't think that he has the lost in his own country that he thinks he has uh, to, to be getting into a nuclear war with the United States and everybody just saying, oh, yes, yes, master. It ain't North Korea. These people got the Internet, too. You know what I mean? Over. Yeah. Uh, coming yeah. coming up is uh, March, March 8th, International Women's Day. That's a huge event in Russia. That's a socialist holiday. Uh, you know, here in America, every day is International Women's Day. But anyway, that's a big holiday in, in Russia. Big, big event. And this invasion kicking off when it did last week, pretty soon bodies are going to start showing back up in Russia that died fighting and International Mother's Day is going to hit. And I think when what we've seen so far with the uh, protests in St. Petersburg and in Moscow are it's a pretty good sizable one that they had in, in St. Petersburg. I'm reading that uh, upwards of a. Uh, uh, 100,000 people were crowding in Nevsky uh, Prospect, which is the main big avenue that goes through the middle of St. Petersburg. I'm thinking you're going to have, you know, 10 times that show up in the, in the next ones. Um, go in addressing back uh, the way that uh, Putin was uh, talking with his uh, SVR chief, uh, Sergei uh, uh, Narishin, Narishkin. Uh, this guy has been probably they... Putin and him went, it's, it's speculated on, uh, on, on uh, Wikipedia that Putin and this guy were classmates at the, at the KGB, KGB Academy. Uh, he's also from uh, former Leningrad, St. Petersburg. And the way that Putin was addressing him was as if Putin was talking to a 12-year-old. This guy is very suave. 
very sophisticated. Um, and I've never seen like somebody quake so badly at the way Putin was addressing him. I, I felt sorry for the dude, man. It reminds me of like some former supervisors that I've worked for in the past, the way that this guy was, was being addressed. And it was absolutely embarrassing uh, on his behalf. But at the, at the same time, as Chuck said, uh, the Putin that we're seeing today is a completely different guy and he is definitely unhinged. You know, uh, I don't think we're seeing as uh, Margaret Thatcher would talk about Gorbachev. Uh, this is a man that we can work with. Uh, it's pr it's proving um, hourly that this is not the in case of the fact. Um, I've heard the same thing of what Chuck said that for the last two years that he is a germaphobe and that uh, I don't know that anybody can get close enough to to affect a regime change if that were to happen. Uh, but I don't remember any event outside of the Cuban Missile Crisis where the nuclear forces have been put on on such a high state of readiness of what they were uh, yesterday, I believe that they that this that this was spun up, and that is not just something that you go and do. That is like a huge escalation, and everybody in in uh, in, in Central and Western Europe right now are probably collectively shitting themselves, and rightly so. So, uh, sorry to get, be long winded on that, but uh, that that was just two very poignant poets points, and I appreciate Chuck for bringing that up, and the eloquent manner in which he did, because it it really does lend one to think that this isn't the guy that we knew two years ago. I'm just thinking about how things work here stateside, and if we have someone act in this manner new laws come about and things ha change happen. So this doesn't happen again. I, I wonder if we get out of this, what are the, what are, what is uh, the rest of the world going to do to ensure that we don't run into something like this again, if that's even remotely possible? Well, we have a system of checks and balances in, in this country. Um, and uh, it, it started because it was found out later on that President Reagan was starting to suffer from Alzheimer's while he was still in, in office. And so the, the ability to, uh, well, it's as simple as the old episodes of Star Trek, like Bones has the authorization to, to declare the captain unfit. And, uh, and in, the, uh, in our, our nuclear uh, de deterrence and all that, the, the cabinet could declare a president, uh, you know, kind of out of his mind uh, and, and therefore the DOD would not have to follow any advances. And all of this was happening at the end of the Trump presidency and it flew largely under the radar. These conversations that uh, Speaker Pelosi was having with General Milley specifically talking about this because because the left was so in a fervor about president Trump uh, be, being, being out of his mind that uh, they believed that he could potentially do, do a nuclear strike on his way out or order a nuclear strike on his way out. Uh, and that, that's why um, there, the, there's these conversations that happen between general Milley and the Chinese uh, saying like, Hey, look, don't listen to this propaganda. Uh, there's no way that we're going to let them nuke you guys. You haven't done anything deserved to get nuked. And everybody, you know, all, everybody on the right is saying like, you're literally talking to your enemy about your president kind, kind of thing. And they framed this general Milley stuff in, in that respect, but maybe some of that deservedly because he's done some other things politically, uh, allegedly, um, that, that were not, you know, st straight true to his job. But th these conversations were happening about military coup, like, like Pelosi sitting here, like, well, this guy works for Trump. If the 20th of January comes and he refuses to leave, like what side of the fence is my army on? I need to know as, a, as civilian leadership. And, and that's the kind of very real conversations that were happening uh, amongst the shadow government the swamp, whatever you want to call them, um, like they, they wanted assurances 
that if something radical happened and President Trump refused to leave office on, on his appointed date. And I was asking the exact same uh, questions when President Obama was in charge. I, I, I was asking Nobody can point to me in the government. Now, now we have the White House police force that or the uh, uh, con um, congressional police force, Capitol police force, whatever, that has grown legs and extended out and has intelligence gathering capability or whatever. But the legislature had no army. And so, you know, I was asking I was asking the question, like, what what happens if a president decides to third term themselves? What happens if 20 January happens and President Obama doesn't leave the White House? Who's the dude with a gun that goes to the White House, move out of the way, Secret Service? I've got paperwork in hand. I'm pulling this dude by the scruff of his neck out of his office and, and placing him under arrest. And nobody can answer that question for me back then. Nobody can answer with the attorney general, that means all federal law enforcement and the Department of Defense all fall under the executive branch of government. If everybody still stays loyal to their boss, who is the person with a gun that goes to the president's office and says, you're fucking out of here on 20 January? And no, nobody could answer that question. If it was not going to come from the FBI through the attorney general by written order of the Supreme Court or something. So all of our systems have some type of gaps in, in the, in the checks and balances. Um, and, but, but in terms of nuclear weapons release, I think that is one that probably has the fewest amounts of gray area in the event that we had had something like that happen. So. Well, that though is in discussion of, and for the listeners air quotes, the good guys. Any, do we have any idea if there's anything on the Russian side? Conversely, or not even conversely, additionally, let's say we get, okay, we get out of this unscathed. Do you think there might be something that will pass in Europe saying, okay, we don't want this to happen again. We don't want some dude to, to lose his marbles and we need to support their people and try to oust their crazy dude. I'd be interested to know if uh, there's been any conversation between General Milley and, uh, Russian Defense Minister uh, Shoigu, uh, that's the guy that's the, uh, the, the Minister of Defense over there, um, an, an army general, Russian army general, um, fairly, uh, fairly advanced in age. I mean, he, uh, I'm seeing here that he was born in, in, 50, in 1955, but, and he's still serving. Uh, I'd be curious to know if, they, if they've had any conversations uh, or if they're able to have any conversations or is Putin just managing to like hoodwink everybody so badly that they're terrified to do anything. Um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of hoping that uh, as Millie was talking to our, our enemies as, as Chuck uh, related to, I'm kind of hoping that somebody back channel wise in the Russian Ministry of Defense is kind of doing the same thing, uh, hopefully calming some fears. You know, I, I really I'm hoping that that's happening. I don't know if it's happening. And if Hillary can suicide people in a free country, imagine what <laughs> Putin can do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you, uh, Matt, you uh, questioned earlier about like what's what's being reported in in Russia on the on the news. So yesterday I was able to spend uh, about two hours uh, on YouTube and watch the uh, that day's uh, broadcast on uh, Russian NTV. Russian NTV is the main news channel uh, that's that's on it's on TV. It's it's almost like CNN. It's like twenty four seven. There's news and. I've been hearing and seeing on, on social media, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and all this, like the Russians don't know what's going on there. They, there's a news blackout. No, they're very aware of what's going on. Um, I, like I said, I watched about two hours of it, had a good grasp of what's going on. Basically they spent the whole time talking about, um, the sanctions and what exactly that they are, uh, what they're going to involve. And it was very detailed information. And it's everything that we've, we've heard here about the uh, crippling of the banks, uh, limiting of uh, uh, SWIFT, uh, access, access to SWIFT. 
and uh, Russian airlines uh, and all Russian carriers not being allowed to land in UK and European uh, airports. Uh, and it was report, and there was they had their reporters all over the place. So they reported from London, Brussels, uh, Bonn, uh, Berlin, um, all of the European capitals. They reported from, and this is, and it was it was very factual. When it came to Ukraine, what was interesting to me was there was no information about uh, uh, Kiev being uh, under siege at the time. It was mostly reporting from the Donbass and uh, Lugansk regions, which were the two breakaway republics that Russia recognized. And um, uh, but they didn't have like information about units crossing in uh, from the south from from Crimea or coming in from Belarus or attacking around uh, those two republics and coming into Ukraine in the pincer movement. There wasn't information about that, just about the Donbass and Lugansk regions, which I found interesting. I didn't get a chance to listen to the news uh, today or watch the news today to get a, an, another feel. But it's uh, it's going on. It's about. 13 minutes until oh, one second uh, until 7 a.m. Moscow time. Bro, that city kicks off roughly at around nine. So in like an hour and a half, uh, we should uh, I'll, I'll flip on the news and see what I can what I can glean and take notes and stuff. But uh, it'd be interesting to see what uh, what breaking days uh, uh, news is. Very much, very much. Um, so. Oh, before, before. I just have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, do you have any, uh, does anyone have any sources about what the Russian military, what their impression of what they're doing is? Do they think they're coming in to, to help orchestrate or help the, these uh, providence, provinces separate? Or do they know that they're actually an invading force? I heard some rumor about some of the troops thought that they were going to be welcomed with open arms. The information that I've seen is, again, from social media, and it shows uh, captured Russian troops and the Ukrainians uh, are questioning them. And uh, they're basically saying we were told it was uh, these are uh, one of them was a uh, air assault unit. And I believe they were captured at uh, Antonov uh, Airfield. And uh, they basically said we were told it was a, an exercise. And then they handed out live ammo. Um, I, I've seen like a couple of others and the Ukrainians aren't mistreating them, but they're not speaking to them nicely. They're, they're doing something worse than harsh tweets. They're, they're verbally uh, berating them. And uh, basically like, why are you here? Uh, we were told it was an exercise. So I'm hearing that on, on a couple of different uh, from a couple of different locations within Ukraine uh, from, from captured, uh, uh, captured Russian troops. So, I mean, it remains to be seen. I'm sure that they're going to spin up the uh, 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 psyops sort of uh, spin on this and start, you know, making sure that Russians are finding out about this. Um, Russians have every access to social media as, as we do. A lot of these uh, guys on, on Twitter, uh, there was, there's Russians on there, there's Ukrainians on there. Um, there's one guy in particular, and I really, really enjoyed looking at his stuff because he's very interesting. Uh, a guy named Rob Lee. Um, he's, his uh, uh, handle or whatever you call it on Twitter is R.A. Lee. Uh, 85. And this guy has some really good information. And he, there's a, he's, he's able to get pictures and dissect the metadata and determine where, where exactly these locations are. I don't know how on earth that he does this, how I could barely uh, download Zoom and get logged into it tonight. But uh, this, uh, this guy has, has got some really good information and he throws out bullet points all the time. That's quite interesting. Uh, a, a tweet that he put out uh, not long ago, uh, he says, uh, my argument regarding Russia's behavior, one, Moscow switched from deterrence to compellence. Uh, two, the key issue is Moscow believes Kiev will remain hostile and is increasing its defensive capabilities. Uh, three, the cost of inaction are greater than escalation. Um, the guy is like spot on, on on a lot of really good information. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are on here that are trying to uh, ghost him on a, on a number of ways, but I think that they're they're probably 
Russians trying to spin uh, their side of it or Ukrainians trying to spin their side of it. Again, I'm not taking sides on this. I would like everybody to go home and play nice, like I said earlier. But uh, if you guys are on Twitter, definitely check this guy out. He's he's pretty interesting. So uh, bef before we go back and talk about the Russian foot soldiers, which uh, I was tracking uh, order of battle stuff from before the invasion during the buildup. Uh, I did not remember because of my age and the fact that I was in Ranger Battalion and doing other things or whatever. I was not tracking the fall of the Soviet Union and the security assurances and and international relationships of Ukraine outside after they've done their independence. Um, so I did some Googling. And if you go to armscontrol.org, they have uh, fact sheets on there. And one of the fact sheets is the timeline of how Ukraine got rid of their nuclear weapons after their break away from the Soviet Union, because that's key, because there were security assurances made in order for us to get those nukes away. When the Ukraine um, declared its independence from uh, the Soviet Union in 1991, they had the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world with 1,900 strategic warheads, 176 ICBMs, 44 strategic bombers. By 96, they had turned all of those nukes over to Russia in exchange for economic and security assurances. And they, those came bilaterally from both the United States and Russia. And that is the cornerstone of we promise that Ukraine is going to be able to remain independent because they wanted to keep the nukes as a deterrence for exactly what is happening now. And we convinced them to give up all their nukes because we were more concerned about uh, bribery, uh, you know, that whole Lord, Lord of War shit with guns and tanks and shit getting sold off to the highest bidder in the void uh, of accountability created in, in the former Soviet bloc. And, and we didn't want, you know, a nuke to be part of that. A, a aka the the peacemaker or the peacekeeper whatever that movie was with Clooney like that was the 90s 90s was counter proliferation counter proliferation counter proliferation a rogue nuke was the threat uh before the arabs figured out that that they could do do some damage with some airplanes um and so it breaks the entire timeline down. This fact sheet breaks the entire timeline down. And so throughout 91, 92, there were multiple negotiations. And each time the Ukrainians were like, nope, not good enough. Still, still think Russia is going to come in and kick our ass uh, later on if we don't have the strategic deterrent. And it culminated in uh, the 1994 Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances. And that basically was able us to start uh, the START treaties. Um, and uh, it was a political agreement in accordance with the principles uh, on the Helsinki Accords. And the memorandum included security assurances against the threat or use of force against Ukraine's territory or its own political independence. The countries promised, countries, US and Russia, promised to respect the sovereignty, sovereign, sovereignty of uh, uh, the existing borders of UK, uh, Ukraine. Parallel memorandums were signed for Belarus and Kazakhstan as well. In response, Ukraine official, officially acceded to the Non-Proliferation Treaty as a non-nuclear weapon state on 5 December 94. And uh, that move met the final condition for ratification of the START Treaty on the same day. Now, START expired in 2009. So in 2009, Russia and the United States again made a joint declaration statement uh, in 2009, confirming that all the security assurances that were made to Ukraine in Budapest 94 would still be valid, even though the START Treaty was expired. So they said, hey, look, START is as a thing gone, but this aspect of START, Ukrainians' right to their own independence and their borders uh, are good to go. Now, after Crimea, uh, basically, 
um, the Russians just declared uh, that the elements that were in power were not lawful. And so they said that the security assurances that were given, talking about uh, under the uh, uh, under the 2009 uh, joint declaration and uh, the <clears throat> Budapest Memorandum of 94, that those assurance security assurances were given to the legitimate government of New Ukraine, Ukraine, not the forces that came to power following the coup d'état. And so they considered the Ukrainian government the pro-Western, anti-Russian Ukrainian government uh, that, that happened after they ousted uh, the uh, Russian puppets, uh, they considered them to be illegitimate. Therefore, uh, all of the security assurances for, for that border are all uh, null and void. Now, the big thing that's happening between the left and the right, the hawks and the doves, whatever here in the United States is... Did our security agreements of Hungary 94 reaffirmed in 2009 equate to an equivalency of Article 5, but for Ukraine, because we told them to give up their, their main method of deterrence and we assured them that they would be secure? So did that assurances mean, well, you don't need these nukes. If Russia comes and starts to kick your ass, we'll bail you out with some NATO. Uh, and I can't find anybody that says that that's what those security uh, security assurances mean meant. But then there's the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law and, and that, that whole intent. So now we're trying to be either revisionist or creationist in those accords to make them fit whatever our narrative is. Now, if you're a pro protect Ukraine guy, you're going to scream uh, Budapest, Budapest, Budapest. If you're an isolationist libertarian uh, pro-Trump, neutral, ru neutral to Russia guy, uh, then, then you're like, Hey man, fucking blot problems, <laughs> fucking leave that shit alone. And, uh, we, we don't have any business, uh, over there. So that, that is as much background as I've been able to gain, having not given two shits about that area. Um, uh, pr prior to th this recent flare up. Now let's talk about, uh, professional military versus all volunteer military versus conscript military. The Russians attempted to make an all volunteer force and they could not uh, meet their uh, recruiting and retention goals. And now they're going to need to refill them too. So, but this goes back to, to bodies and body bags. So an element a percentage of the Russian Federation's military is still conscripted. I don't know if the conscripts are integrated in with all volunteer guys to kind of boost up numbers, but then have mentorship or whatever. But what I have heard from open source Intel was that the battalion task groups, that's the unit of action that has been created based off the successes in Georgia uh, and uh, successes and failures of Georgia and, and uh, the Crimean campaign. And it's basically like our brigade combat team, but the unit of action is smaller. It's an armored company and some infantry companies, but lots of organic uh, signals, intelligence, and electronic warfare and artillery capability. Um, so battalion task group is the unit of action for the, for the Russian military. Uh, I was, uh, I read in the open source order of battle development uh, that was happening as these forces were being building up over the past couple months. Everybody's been like, hey, they're building an army. Hey, they're building an army. Hey, look, they've gone over into fucking Belarus. They're now in Belarus. Oh, look, the entire Baltic fleet is coming around. Wonder if there's Marines on those ships. As all of this was happening, uh, actual units of action by, by number were starting to get open source and dropped in there. And, uh, and essentially like one of those red flags, like, Oh, whole blood. We've heard the mainstream media, whole blood, whole blood, field hospital, field hospital. You know, like my man said in, uh, in, uh, in um, Crimson Tide, they're fueling their missiles. You don't put on a condom unless you want to fuck. Um, but these battalion task groups were compiled of all volunteers. 
So none, allegedly none of the conscript military of the Russian Federation's army were assigned. So that means if they were integrated units before, they literally stripped the conscripts out of the formation and then did individual replacements from other BTGs that are not currently in this fight and stacked the squads full of all volunteer guys or they had lower tiered units that were more, more conscript ish and higher tiered units that were already all volunteer. And they handpicked from all around Russia, not just geographically to the region. And they moved BTGs in that probably had a higher stack on the basis of issue plan for new gear. So new, newer equipment higher on the list and all volunteer force higher on the list, and they took those BTGs and fed them in there. So whether they compiled, made composite units that were all volunteer, or they assigned BTGs that were already all volunteer, allegedly everything that went into Belarus and everything that stacked on the Eastern Front was all volunteer forces. And that, to me, was a huge flag, even larger than whole blood at the field hospital, because it showed about the Russian people and the Russian mothers and the body bags that were coming back. And just like the French foreign legion, when you have a professionalized all volunteer force and they go out and get shellacked, it's patriotic young patriots that volunteered to serve their country. They lost their lives. When you take dudes off the street and say, no, take that shit out of your face and your nose, fucking cut your hair off and carry this rucksack for two years. And then you kill that guy. Uh, it has a greater um, psychological effect, negative psychological effect. It doesn't poll as well uh, back on the home front. And so uh, that to me was showing like this guy's putting an A team together. Like he's putting an A team together that when he takes inevitable casualties, they're not going to sting quite as bad. Um, and I was tracking this fucking weeks ago. Um, that that that's what was in Bel Belarus doing combined arms live fire exercises was a handpicked all volunteer force of battalion task groups set up for the purpose of a regime change. And that's why I did not think that they were going to take the I know we only hold 30 percent control of these two provinces, but we're going to declare both of them shits and we're only going to use this force to take the other two thirds of each one of these two states. I'm like, bullshit. You don't bring the whole Baltic fleet around unless you want the port of Odessa. You don't bring all these dudes up into Belarus unless you want to try to, uh, to isolate and decapitate uh, the capital of, of uh, Kiev. Uh, speaking of Kiev, uh, Yancey, can you talk to us about Ukrainian, Russian, Kiev versus Kiev? Because it's one of those na namey things. I call, I, I call it Kiev, but right? with, uh, with all of the national nationalism on, on both sides, Russian side, Ukrainian side, suddenly it's Kiev. And I'm, <laughs> what? And then I see like three different spellings of it. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> That's some, coming to, that's some coming to America, Muhammad Ali shit. His mama <laughs> called him Cassius. I'm going to call him Cassius. Uh, so. so are they chicken yeah. Kiev's now? I, I, I guess. For, for me, it's always going to be ki ki uh, chicken Kiev. Uh, that's, uh, I've, I've been saying it one way for so long, I, it's hard for me to change it to another way. <laughs> um, but what Chuck was alluding to about some of these units getting – uh, brought into the theater of operations from all over Russia. Uh, on the Russian Far East, um, there's uh, 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 an air assault, uh, uh, I don't think it's a division size, I think it's a brigade size, uh, way on the Russian Far East, like up on the Chinese border, Chinese-Mongolian border up, up in that area. There was guys that were captured uh, that were being interrogated, and that's where they came from. They were a long ways away from home. So, Chuck, in, in, in your opinion, with what's what exactly what you just, just described, would you would you say those that got sent in are less effective? As opposed to those that they're holding on to? No, no, I don't know that for sure. And there's a lot of people that are saying, hey, look, they sent in the conscripts first and the reserve is their higher echelon guys. And I'm thinking they might have sent in their grunts first and they are holding back their higher tiered 
dudes. But to my knowledge, unless at the last minute they brought in a bunch of stuff and, and, and the conscripts somehow got added back into the mix. Um, and, and that's what I'm, a professional force and an all volunteer force are two different things. One has a capability and the only thing these two have in common is uh, they all volunteered and said, I want to join the Russian army volunteer to join the Russian army. Doesn't have shit all to do with being properly supported, uh, logistically maintained or, or anything else. I'm not saying that I'm not saying these are all Spetsnaz. I'm saying these are all volunteers. And I, the only reason that that makes a shit bit of difference in my mind is to the body bags that are going to start coming back home and on mother's we, day. Yes. And so, <laughs> That, and and the fact that that the planners had that presence of mind that they didn't want to have draftees, it's like the stop loss thing. Remember in Iraq, the whole stop loss thing, all of a sudden it's that much worse because this guy volunteered for eight years of federal service, but only two of it was supposed to be active. And we say, yo dog, we're changing the, we're changing the arrangement. You're going to do two plus active and then whatever else in the IRR, like, sorry, you didn't read your contract when you signed up all enlistments are for eight, 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 eight years of service with this old conversation from back in, in light fighter, you know, 15 years ago um, when everybody was all stop loss, butt hurt, but we realized stop loss created butt hurt and killing conscripts is that same kind of angst of the stop loss. Like they didn't even want to fucking be there and you're forcing them to, to fight right. And die. Um, and uh, so I just, I just find that, find that interesting. Um, and, and again, I'm using the air quotes and allegedly a lot because it's open source. Now, some open source locations are better than others. And that's probably a decent segue for us to get into the, the, the dis disinformation, misinformation, propaganda side of this conversation that I'm sure everybody's chomping at the bit. Fuck it goes to Kiev. I want to believe, tell it on the mountain, right? Let, like, let's. Let's have some some shit. I was heartbroken today when I found out that apparently the the Snake Island 13 was actually 73 and uh, and they're all they're all in a fucking gulag somewhere like that story isn't just nearly as cool as dying to the last man in an artillery block barrage. At what point when the government confirms that these dudes are lost and they're going to give them all the Medal of Honor like that's much different than pulling some 2004 of cocktail fucking video and forwarding it without doing any due diligence when there's already a wiki about the fight, when the government's already acknowledging that the fight has happened, that they've lost control of the Island and that they're going to posthumously give the medals of honor to the people that died there. That's a little bit more solid information than, than the airborne fly, or uh, flying version of Juba, the sniper uh, that's taking down everything Russian uh, over the country of Ukraine. My fucking engine two's out. Goddamn ghost did it. And, uh, so it just, the shit just builds on itself. And, and so like, maybe we need to talk about that next. Uh, one thing to, to add, uh, what, what I found interesting uh, in regarding units fighting for the Russians is that there's a Chechen brigade that uh, has arrived in theater. And I, I remember very well uh, the, the two wars fought in Chechnya and how that was this absolutely decimated. But with the current leader that they have there, Kadrov, uh, absolutely pro-Russian, and they've rebuilt the country. And the fact that there are Chechens who, last I checked, hated fucking Russians, uh, that there is a brigade fighting for them in Ukraine. And uh, I'm hearing like I'm seeing some some news where uh, uh, the, the, their their general and he looks pretty young to be a fucking general, but uh, he got he got he got smacked on the, some con some convoy and most of the uh, convoy was was wiped out. Um, I'm hoping that that's uh, that's that's true. I mean, I'm not hoping that it's true. I'm hoping that it's factual that we're seeing all this. But the fact that there are, are Chechen volunteers. Uh, a brigade at a brigade level that's fighting there. Uh, that's very telltale. Very hey man, vet vet bros are a thing, dude. When you're when you're thinking back about the glory days, and you're like, man, fucking regular life sucks. I, I want to go back to 
burning people alive in their armored personnel carriers. Remember that time I dropped that RKG three off the roof? Oh shit, yeah. And then they they come by. Hey, Chechens, y'all y'all want to kill some people? Well, fuck yeah, who don't? Get get the BMP, let's go. <laughs> I mean, real quiet here in Grozny lately. Let's roll like, to Ukraine. I, I really don't think they give a shit who they're killing. Like when mm. you've killed when you've killed that many people and liked it, you, you're just like, yo, man, let's go get our let's go get our export jihad on and uh and go go slack some dudes uh you know for for money or religion whichever um doesn't surprise me one bit man yeah money money's uh money speaking on this one because i think they're they look very well equipped uh they look very fit uh they look uh i wouldn't say fanatical but they look very enthusiastic yep Um, regarding the, the ghost of Kiev, I think that's the modern day uh, Vasily Zaitsev in this conflict where it was questioned whether Vasily Zaitsev, the Soviet sniper in Stalingrad, was actually a real dude. And if it wasn't just something manufactured to bolster morale of uh, the Soviet troops defending the city against the Germans. Um, you know, it's maybe it's it, maybe it's factual. Maybe it's not. But, you know, everybody needs a hero in every conflict. Our uh, our buddy Stephen um, from Blue Force posted a picture of the digied out MiG twenty nine, um, and he said, "Look, I I know the ghost of Kiev's like pro wrestling, but but goddamn it, I need this right now." And um, and I think that speaks to propaganda. Like we we think that propaganda has this bile and negative uh, connotation. Somebody's trying to feed you a lie. Um, whereas they could just be downplaying negatives and upplaying positives and framing and showing you things in a certain light. Like everything you're exposed to every day at this point is fucking propaganda. Pro-vax, pro, pro anti-vax, uh, follow the science uh, conspiracy theory. Like it, it's all a search for our own preconceived uh, confirmation biases. And that's why like the left is insane about thinking that we're all pro Russian. They all think that like, we love Russia. Somebody sent me a fucking picture of a chick at CPAC holding a Russian flag, like on a stick that said Trump on it. When I was talking about all the left being Manchurian candidates. Uh, and they're like, Oh really? Where are the Manchurian candidates? Where, where, where are the fucking commies? And I'm like, yeah, look at your ideology, bro. And he's like, yeah, that's why we've got people at CPAC, uh, show, you know, waving Russian flags. So, um, when we all look back to the Russian collusion, collusion, and the Hillary email servers, and Flynn getting fired, and the fake FISA warrants, and all of that, that created a really jaded narrative where the right was just pushing back against anything that was evil Russia because evil Russia was all manufactured bullshit. And so somehow, uh, or it was business as usual bullshit. Like they interfere with every election, just like we interfere with every election. That's, that's part of what you do. It's free shots at your political adversaries and you just throw propaganda out and see what sticks. Right. And so the Russians on Facebook making fake ass memes to stir shit up uh, or whatever that that's business as usual. That's not Russian collusion. That's not Russia trying to interfere with an election. Russia hacking voting machines would be them trying to interfere with an election, which did not happen that anybody can prove. Um, and so we went into this already in our camps and it, it and that's a fallback from the Trump victory and then the fall of Trump with the, with the assaults and the, and uh, impeachments that followed after there was this narrative that the Russians were evil and that they were colluding with Trump to maintain his position of power. And so anybody that was 
pro-Trump, ambivalent about Trump, but hated them some Democrats or just straight up libertarian, um, that they were of the impression of don't say another goddamn thing to me about Russia. I don't want to hear nothing more about Russia because everything Russia, Russia, Russia has been bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Now, if we follow the, the Chuck, the Chuck Condoleezza Rice, President Marcone fucking Rubio theory, my man's gone fucking crazy and planned an invasion. And the whole time we're saying, we don't want to hear about that. We, we don't want to hear about Biden's got some domestic issues. So he's, he's spawning up a war, like calm the fuck down conservative. Um, just because the Russians were not colluding doesn't mean that the Russians aren't fucking shit bags. A broken watch is right twice a day kind of thing. And, uh, and so that's why a lot of us got caught flat footed. A lot, a lot of, I don't, when I say us, I'm talking about libertarians and right-wing people, not myself personally, because I hate me. Some Russians always have, um, and, uh, not Russian people, but, but, but the state, if you will, communist or oligarch, the state. Um, and I know what a fucking, I know what invasion prep looks like. And so I would be trying to tell people like, he's going to fucking invade Ukraine guys. And then they couldn't ignore that anymore. Then they had to change their narrative to, well, fine, but it's not, it's not our problem. We shouldn't get involved. Uh, you know, classic fucking pre-World War II isolationist stuff. And I'm not saying we should be rolling Bradley's into Ukraine right now either. I'm saying that if we had taken a different stance uh, going into this, there's possible, it's possible that we could have gotten through that, that crazy man's head and made him understand. We all know he would have done this shit with Trump. We know he wouldn't have. Because because it's because gangsters understand gangsters, thugs understand that thug life. And they know that fucking Trump would not have played that bullshit. Putin already lost the fucking Wagner brigade to Trump not playing that bullshit. The second that he found out that the Russians knew that there were Americans on the ground, he told Dunstan to make an example out of them. We didn't have to fly fucking B-52s out of Diego Garcia to take care of Russian mercenaries. We did it because Arclight says something. Arclight says, fuck you. MLRS could have done it. Marine 155s could have done it. Apaches could have done it. Javelins could have done it. They all did do it. And let me sprinkle you with some B-52s too to give you an extra measure of fuck you because we know that you fucking knew. And... Show me another fucking president that's killed Russians. But but apparently President Trump is, is a Russia lover. Show me somebody else that's fucking stacking Russians. And he got away with it. What's what? interesting is the total shift in whenever the Republicans or the right was uh, the, the hawks against uh, uh, Soviet and, 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 and Russian uh, things. And the, and the Democrats or the left would be the first to appease. Well, we don't want to argue with them. We really need salt uh, ratification. We really need start ratification. Let's not rattle their cages too much. Now it's like, whoosh, they switched and it's now now the 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 democrats the left whatever are uh, extremely hawkish against uh, all things russia and the and the republicans are supposed to be like appeasing them uh, when the shit did that happen you know <laughs> what <laughs> it, it's the hawks have become the doves and the doves have become the hawks but everybody is still if the other side says black you have to say white and, you know, I've said it many, many times on here, just because Adolf Hitler says the sky's blue, that does not mean it is a fucking lie. And uh, and so just because the right the, the, the right gets it wrong or the left gets it right once, no matter what camp you're in, you've got to call the facts as 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 you see them. And this dude was hell bent to 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 roll into Ukraine and everything that happened, all the diplomacy, all the posturing, it was all a bunch of bullshit. This was predestined because he knew that the United States was not going to put skin in the game. If What's we had, if we had threatened, if we had threatened boots on the ground, he would not have gone to war with the United States and NATO over Ukraine. But when we took troops on the ground off the table, Cleared hot, cleared hot. Let's go. 
you know, it gets interesting whenever uh, you have that many forces, as, as, as Chuck said, you have that many forces, that kind of force uh, in theater. Uh, for instance, like in uh, 2003 uh, uh, in, uh, in Iraq, uh, it gets to a point where you have so much there, you just might as well have the war. So it's cheaper to have the war than to bring them bring them all back. And I think that's definitely another aspect that we've seen. But right now, he doesn't want to, Putin, I mean, doesn't appear to me that he's ready to negotiate or he's ready to drop anything out. Uh, last night at around 7, uh, 7 p.m., 1900 uh, local Arizona time, was the 72-hour uh, benchmark. And I'm thinking that, now, now that Sunday's uh, wrapping up and uh, Monday, it's rolling into Monday over there, Monday morning, I think there's going to be a, 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 a distinct uh, escalation and in, in stuff. Uh, like I said, I've been watching the live feeds out of Kiev, uh, the, uh, cam the cams over there at uh, Maidan Square. Occasionally, I'll hear some gunshots. Uh, uh, I'll hear some rifle fire, small arms fire. I'll hear air raid sirens. I'll hear distant explosions. But for the most part, traffic's moving quietly no one's hauling ass uh, but i think that's gonna i think that's gonna change i think that's gonna change but i did see some news here probably about three hours ago where uh looks like the ukrainians and the russians are gonna start talking which is a good thing but everybody's been bamboozled before and who knows what what good will come of it uh, if, all i know is that ukrainian president better not go to the belarusian border they're sending a motherfucker um because I don't, I don't trust the Russians for a minute that they wouldn't nuke that dude's convoy en route or shoot his aircraft down uh, and uh, be like. Russian politicians yeah. are always dying in aircraft flights, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> um, I know that that, that, that large uh, resupply convoy came out of uh, Belarus. Uh, they say in three miles long armored vehicles and, uh, oh. and trucks. So I think I think that there's your ammo, there's your fuel, there's your chow, there's your relief forces to pass off the dudes that have pressed the fight and let them get some sleep. Uh, and I, I think we will see a more concerted effort um, to push the Ukrainian suburbs uh, out of the northwest here within the next you know 24 to 48 probably. Lukashenko, uh, president of Belarus, was uh, feigning ignorance that he knew nothing about any of this that was going to kick off. Yet, a sizable amount of the forces, um, uh, the VDV uh, airborne units that uh, tried to take uh, uh, Antonov Airport, uh, staged out of uh, out of Belarus. So you can't tell you can't tell me that he wasn't complicit, and he's feigning ignorance now. Well, I had no idea that this was going to happen. Um, Especially whenever he starts seeing all of the uh, uh, sanctions that are being applied to not only Russia, but his country as well. Um, as I was uh, alluding earlier, I was supposed to be going to the uh, IWA trade show in, in uh, Nuremberg, supposed to be leaving on Tuesday. Uh, all the Russian exhibitors, Russian and Belarusian exhibitors and visitors were sent an email that basically said, you're incommunicado, you are uninvited, don't come. So I've never seen anything like that happen. I remember going to Iwa in the mid nineties and uh, there were Serbians uh, showing there. They didn't get uninvited, um, you know, but the Russians sure as shit did this year. Interesting, interesting times we live in gentlemen. Yeah. So, you know, back to disinformation, uh, you know, I heard um, that uh, Belarusian forces went ahead and committed with, with Russians, uh, on that front. Um, and you just th these are the types of things that you hear and you're like, how, how do you know? And, uh, and, and it takes a while to sort through this. Some sources are more trusted than others, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I am thoroughly convinced looking at the Snapchat heat map, that Snapchat has been completely censored. Um, the when you look at the amount of, of snaps that are on the heat map in Ukraine compared to everywhere else, it's like a faint pale blue on on, uh, on the heat map. And uh, the in the AM after uh, D DDH hour first night, uh, there was a guy that got up to go. 
um, do PT or something in Odessa. And it was like 6 a.m. in the morning and took a snap in Odessa and and was like, oh, look over there. And there's a fucking cruiser off the coastline. And I posted um, a link to that or maybe I screen grabbed the picture and posted it. But I went back a couple of hours later and that snap was completely gone. Uh, and then throughout the first day I'm looking and I'm like, I should be seeing all kind of blown up phone videos of the Russians just hammering the Donbass and, and, and all of that. And I'm not seeing any of them. like Snapchat. You'll occasionally see like, he's like, be safe out there or I'm still around, but you can't find no Snapchat videos of uh, military hardware on either side. So I believe that the, the, the data space in there is being manipulated by state actors or their proxies, probably. Uh, why UA map is not getting hit uh, like that, I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think that there, there's probably some censorship, that stuff that is, that is already going on. Um, and that, that further complicates things as well, because it's not just about propaganda. When you start talking about pull, pulling information down off, that's a, a different level of, of information operations uh, than talking up your, your successes, maybe exaggerating your successes, downplaying your losses, um, which, by, by the way, the Ukrainians have done a phenomenal job of. The whole world is pro-Ukraine right now. Like, they are inspired. It's like watching a Rocky movie. Everybody is inspired after the disappointment of the Afghan to protect his chance at democracy that was given to him by the blood of the West for 20 years. We handed him money, equipment, a functional government, and walked away, and they could shit for three months. Um, we we see now what a will to fight look like looks like, and um, I don't think there would be as many people willing to help out the underdog. I think there are elements that right now that are just like, man, the Russians are a bunch of big meanies and these people are willing to go fight with kitchen knives and Molotovs. Like, I think we should give them some of our old military shit. So in that concept was propaganda that bad. What was propaganda? Is it evil? Was it insidious? Um, Propaganda serves a purpose and has always served a purpose. Whether it be World War II movies showing victory on the home, uh, the victories abroad, uh, being played before movies in the theater, to uh, pushing for war bonds to finance the war, uh, rationing of, of uh, chocolate and silk and all, all those other commodities uh, to put the country on a wartime footing. The War Department had to sell that shit. Um, and I don't think that you could have gotten the level of consensus and support from the American population today if you had CNN covering the firebombing of Dresden and the you know incineration of X amount of tens of thousands of German white people uh, at the hands of, of, of other white people. Um, that I don't think that shit would have played well. I don't Definitely. think it would have played well. What's that, Nancy? Definitely a bad optic, isn't it? Right. I mean, we we were we were inherently racist back then, and we dehumanized the Japanese. Um, I'm watching old World War II uh, training videos, and there was one called uh, "How Not to Get Killed," and it's this U.S. staff sergeant, and he shoots this uh, Japanese sniper out of a tree and then sees the other guy when he has a, a weapons malfunction and tells him to get out of the tree. And the staff sergeant goes up there and he's talking like, all oh, like, yeah, see, and he's got this M1 grand with a bayonet on it. And, uh, and my man's like, well, the one guy's wounded and he's like, yeah, shut up both of you. You know, I should run, I should run you through with the bayonet. You killed 10 guys out of my platoon and they were, uh, they were good men, you know, and the ja the Japanese sniper with the wounded arm is like, uh, but sir, no, that's not true. Your men were stupid. 
And he's like, I'll stab you. And the guy's like, the guy, and the, the whole training video was like lessons learned from the eyes of this Japanese sniper about the shit that this staff sergeant's troops had done in terms of improper IMT, improper camouflage, improper noise and light discipline that had gotten them whacked by the sniper. But the, they're ap- actual Japanese actors in this film. And I'm thinking when the film uh, was being made, I was like, did they like literally go to the Manzanar Relocation Center and pull these guys out of the POW <laughs> camp to go to Hollywood on the soundstage to do this thing for the war department? Did they get like a weekend pass and then got sent back to the concentration camp or whatever? So I'm looking at this black and white video, but I'm looking at it through the eyes of knowing now what we were doing to Japanese Americans then, right? Um, so I think that if we had CNN showing the firebombing of Tokyo and, and that hundred thousand people that we barbecued, it probably would have had the same effect to the American psyche of that day as, uh, the Brits and the Americans roasting everybody at Dresden. Um, yeah. I, I think, I think 60,000 dead crackers beat beats a hundred thousand dead Japanese, uh, in the eyes of the, of the racist American of the, of the, of the 1940s, but so, so speaking of support, what kind of what's happening? How is Europe responding? How is NATO responding? I understand there's a lot of uh, arms and ammunition being shipped over. Germany said that they would c- commit to uh, uh, javelins, javelins or uh, in-laws, uh, also uh, whatever equivalent of a stinger that they have. They're going to supply that. They generally do not support with lethal uh, military hardware. Uh, Earlier, they offered uh, Ukraine some helmets and some some MREs, but then they did an uh, abrupt uh, 180 on that and said that they were going to apply that. Uh, Norway is committed to uh, sending some... uh, anti-tank hardware. I'm guessing that it's probably in-laws and, and uh, 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 javelins as well. Um, UK has been kind of silent other than applying the sanctions, but understand they have a financial stake in, in, uh, in Russia with uh, BP and other oil companies. Um, I found it very interesting that uh, we're going to, R- remove select banks from SWIFT uh, in Russia, but we will continue with, uh, according to Biden, because I listened to his speech three times to make sure that I understood exactly what he was saying. They're removing certain banks from SWIFT, but they're going to continue with uh, energy payments uh, to Russia. So in the form of uh, natural gas and oil, uh, of the uh, if the oil that we imported equals uh, 100%, uh, 11% of the oil that comes into the United States comes from Russia. So all this, all this is open source stuff. I Googled it. Uh, there's various uh, things out there. Financial Times has some of the best reporting about what is going on and who and who's vested in what. Um, so uh, Germany balked at uh, taking uh, Russia off of SWIFT. And they, uh, the reason for that is they are wholly dependent on Rus- Russian natural gas, as is the Czech Republic. And Russian natural gas goes as far south as Spain and Portugal. So a lot of Europe is going to get pretty cold, I'm thinking, uh, between now and, uh, and April or May. I think the, a lot of folks are going to get pretty chilly. So um, where do I start with that? Uh, so the Brits were the first ones to give lethal aid. They shipped javelins before anybody else. Boris Johnson went on the record uh, the other day saying that they were going to continue uh, military uh, shipments. They also said they were going to accept refugees uh, from uh, the Ukrainian conflict as well. Um, uh, every, everybody, if you don't know that it, Russia supplying natural gas to Europe is not new, Nordstrom 2 was the last circumvention of the checks and balances that the Ukrainians had to protect themselves. The pipeline, as it runs, runs through Ukraine, and the Russians have to pay the Ukrainians something like $2 billion a year, whatever, as a pass-through to supply Germany. But if the Russians did something stupid, 
the Ukrainians could have cut the, the pipeline. So by circumventing and going around Ukraine, not only does Russia not have to pay that $2 billion, they get to pocket that money because they're now shipping direct to Germany. Now Ukraine ain't got nothing to cut off. You can't, you can't invade me. I'll cut off the, the, the natural gas pipeline. Um, so, so Nordstrom 2 was, but by design, um, a, another... Uh, stripping away of the strategic deterrence that that Ukraine had that kept Russia from being able to, to put their eye on the prize. Um, the Germans, man, I, I, I do not, I'm not a big, big fan of uh, p- post-fall reunification Germany. Um, but talk about a hardcore 180. From 5,000 helmets in just short order. And again, I think this is because they too are seeing the dude isn't rational. They thought in their analytical brains, he's a gangster. Power and money, power and money, power and money. I can negotiate with the known bad guy as long as I know that he keeps it business. And now they're seeing somebody that that they can't negotiate with he's acting irrationally he's a fucking wild card and um you know in just 48 72 hours they went from 5000 helmets and rations to military support of the ukrainians a promise that they were going to increase their own department of history of defense production to 2% of their gdp to rebuild their own military because they've been fine outsourcing their own security to NATO, AKA the United States for the past 70 years. And now they thought, wow, might, might want to have our own army because apparently new, new Europe is not as safe as we thought new Europe w- was. And then finally we fucked up with our dependency on a potential adversary for our energy needs. And we are going to work to rectify that situation. So as much as I want to shit on Germany and say too little, too late, I look internally to our own domestic situation. Yancey is not wrong uh, about Russian energy importation. I didn't know we were getting this goddamn barrel of anything from Russia. And then I find, I find out that we're buying half a million barrels of fucking oil from those cocksuckers per day. Guess how much the Keystone Pipeline could produce? 800 and something thousand barrels a day. Show me a single, not all of them, not general consensus. Find me a fucking Democrat in this country, in political office now, that was on record as supporting the fucking closure of the Keystone Pipeline that is now on record willing to say that our national security trumps our green agenda and that we need to immediately reopen Keystone or find alternative sources of energy. And we need to stop all foreign energy purchases from Russia as soon as it is feasibly possible to the United States. And why don't we go ahead and throw the strategic petroleum reserve at the pro- uh, problem to offset the deficit until we get our new supply line set up? Find me a single Democrat anywhere, anywhere that is willing to say we were wrong. We didn't understand what energy independence meant. Yes, Dead dinosaurs are bad for the planet. So it's getting fucking nuked. So, so it's let's, uranium. Yeah, let's let's deal with our immediate fucking problems and, and then worry about some other shit. And just like their answer, and, and Yancey's right about the doves becoming hawks and the hawks becoming doves, back during all this non-proliferation bullshit, and I'm sure these armscontrol.org people are a bunch of goddamn leftists. They've got a... Uh, Vice President Biden quote on the front of their thing. Um, uh, no, Senator Biden from 2004. I want to thank the Arms Control Association for being such effective advocates for sensible policies to stem the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and most importantly, reduce the risk of nuclear war. If 
go back and look at the radical left in the 80s, they were fans of a form of disarmament called unilateral disarmament. That means, hey, United States, get rid of half of nuclear, your nuclear missiles. And then the Russians will have absolute overmatch. But then they'll see that we're not a threat and they'll get rid of some of their nuclear missiles too because they're nice guys with no assurance. When our only measure of nuclear defense then was mutually assured destruction and the left wanted to give up the entire concept of MAD and just start taking nuclear weapons off the table automatically. Well, we don't trust them, but they don't trust us. And they're really good people. And they're just, they're just scared too. So if we put out the olive branch first to just get rid of our nukes, they're going to follow. And I believe that's the exact same attitude that they have about the green movement in this country. Make us carbon neutral. Show me a fucking plan to make India and China become carbon neutral. We all breathe the same air. It's the same fucking biosphere. So I'm all about reducing the carbon footprint too. Show me a fucking plan to make our adversaries do that shit. There is none. There is none. So yeah, turn the fucking Keystone pipeline back on. And I'm one of the right wingers that isn't a fucking climate denier. I believe that the climate is changing. Now, whether it's man-made or a natural cyclical accommodation of the two or whatever, I don't fucking know. But our climate's changing and our jet stream's kind of fucked up right now. And uh, so, you know, if you could show me how, how to make renewable energy sources that are cool, I'm on board. But until then, better have some dinosaurs and some nuclear power plants on tap. Who was and that so, the president that said that he's been quoting, uh, he's been, uh, his quotes have been popping up on social media lately, saying that he hopes that Putin respects the, the climate change agreement, the Paris Accords. Who was yeah, that? John Kerry, man. Our climate czar, our climate czar driving around in his, uh, flying around his private plane, trying to stay relevant. <laughs> uh, UA, UA, uh, uh, the live map uh, just updated. Uh, northeast of Kiev, there was uh, two uh, drone strikes by the Ukrainians using the Turkish, uh, what is it, uh, TB2 uh, drones. Just updated. Yeah, Funker 530 had been showing some of that. That guy's awesome. That guy's been having some really good stuff. Yeah, not not bad, not bad. Um, and Matt's here. Mac, unmute yourself. Let's step up. For a second. Sorry about that. I got a, uh, a new program. Uh, I haven't used them before. What's up, Chuck? You guys got me? Very much. Uh, yeah, uh, long time. I uh, haven't been on the podcast in a while. Um, I kind of wish... Uh, Kind of what Cheryl was here. He kind of grew up in that same general time frame that uh, Chuck and Yancey did. So having the the historical perspective uh, it, from his perspective would have been great. But he he's an old man. He's got to get up in the early in the morning. Um, no, uh, Matt M. Uh, you find me Nick occasionally on primary and secondary. I don't really post much anymore. Um, active Army in 05. To 2012, got out, did the contracting thing for about five years from 2013 to 2019, and then uh, now working as a police officer. Uh, recently got back from a Polish uh, Poland rotation in uh, near the Swalki Gap, um, which was an interesting perspective. Uh, I don't know how much I can share because my my perspective was more of the the dude on the ground. Um, but it was kind of interesting to see how much, uh, guys were discussing that actually gave a fuck, uh, the guys that were discussing stuff on the ground level and what the perception was, uh, well, you guys were kind of touching on disinformation, uh, and misinformation and propaganda. And it was, uh, one of the things I see most commonly, I mean, the same military that you guys were speaking of with regard to Wagner group, is uh, the same military that every vet bro is like has been poo pooing is somehow weaker than this, weaker than that. You know, is not 
you know, can't kill the enemies, blah, blah, we're going to get torn to pieces by the Russians. Uh, yeah, we turned that Wagner group into a parking lot. And yeah, so that might have been some specialized elements, but it's all just combined arms and combined firepower. So I think it's uh, it's interesting from that perspective, being kind of the, the line grunt and seeing what people's perceptions of uh, both their own military and the Russians are. Um you know, and I kind of don't count because I'm coming from the National Guard side. Um, but it's true even on the any, any of the vet bro communities. Uh, they're just as guilty as peddling the Russians' water for them. Yeah. Right. We have a bad problem with technology. Um, like, let's get a – I don't have one handy. But like, the, the laminated shot show handout – business development marketing packet that shows all the technical specs for whatever ops core helmet or whatever the fuck you, you, you're grabbing at shot. We go to these defense trade shows, GRU goes and our guys go and we grab, we grab these flyers and that's where a bunch of this crap comes from. In terms of requirement, when I say crap, I'm talking about new programs like next generation squad weapon, uh, you know, X sappy plates and just bullshit like that. Once we find out that the enemy has something, when I say has a capability, they built something like SU-57, fifth generation fighter. Anybody seen an SU-57 over fucking Ukraine? Maybe they're up. It's a prototype. So uh, speaking to that though, Chuck, I was actually kind of surprised to see some, and I, I, I am not the AFV, you know, the, the, the armored vehicle recognition guru, which I should be because of my, my positions revolves around reconnaissance, but um, the, I have been seeing either T eighties and uh, T 90 at least quoted, and that can be easily somebody labeling it on in Ukraine as having gotten destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, I, I, I saw him. My point is, is my point is like with a unit like yours, right? If we go grab the the flyers, the 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 PDF documents for the striker versus a BMP 100, and it's like, oh, we all gonna die. The, I, their bullets will penetrate our armor. Our armor can't penetrate that. It's fucking Sherman tank and Tiger tank, whiny baby back bullshit all over again. If we don't have material overmatch we're gonna lose like that is the that is the the armchair quarterback internet version of everything on the vet bro side is if if this tanks stats like it's fucking rifle in call of duty what's its attributes its velocity is this but it's fucking whatever is only that um and we we try to play hardware versus hardware instead of how they're being employed, what they're going to be doing, what their capability is. You know, a a, a striker AFB might only have a 50 cal uh, RWS on it, but that bitch can hold a lot of javelins. And all the scout platoon memes of the dudes carrying the shit, I've been to JRTC, dog. I know what, I have one shot to hit this vehicle. And as soon as I fire this one shot, I'm fucked. And um, so I've seen the anti-tank guided missile fight in both training and in AARs from the Gulf War. And the amount of ordnance that you can bring to a fight matters. And so infantry fighting vehicle versus infantry fighting vehicle, main battle tank versus main battle tank, EW and artillery versus EW and artillery, it, it, it is all how it is employed and what you are willing to do with it. So speaking to that, uh, so we befriended uh, one of the badged uh, British British uh, snipers that was over there, uh, the second British unit that was there. First of all, the Brits roll hard when they train, so I got a lot of respect for him. Uh, second of all, he told us a uh, a pretty fucking amusing story of. So, what what is their current tank? Is that the Crusader? Whatever their current battle tank is, like their main battle tank. Challenger, isn't it? Challenger, Challenger. Too. Thank you, Challenger. Well, he said that in training, when they do their force on force, uh, the Challengers are scared to fucking death of those little Land Rovers with their scouts in them, because the Challenger with that sight, 
when it starts to, uh, when you basically key up to release, it will go from whatever, whatever magnification it is and zoom into to max magnification on the target. So if you've got a small enough, nimble enough target, you can dance out of that and they, they can't quite hit you. And not only that, but they can't, you get in close enough and they can't turn the turret fast enough. And I was like, wait a minute, don't they have a, you know, something on top to at least deal with that? He's like, not in training. So they're, they're finding ways to exploit, you know, the training isms, but then all they do is just drive around circles and they're calling grid and they're like, just wait, just calling to their FO saying, just wait till um, it's like two minutes out and then I'll fuck off. And then they just drive away and then notional kill on the challenger. It, the, the image though, of a bunch of uh, challengers running away from little land rovers is <laughs> <laughs> so my Facebook post on my, on my personal page, and I know most of you guys are not friends with me on my personal page. Um, but that post that I made about the training scars of the joint readiness training center, national training center, Hollenfelds and the miles battlefield versus the real battlefield. Those are very real going back to the world war two videos. I posted one, uh, the other day called how to crack a tank. And it was anti-tank TTPs. Some of those were the same ones I learned in sniper school. Shoot at the periscopes. They have a blast cover that covers the thermal weapon site aperture. At, if you can hit this at 300 meters, you can put a round right through the thermal imaging screen of, of a main battle tank and knock its night sight completely out of the fight. TTPs like that cannot be employed the saving private Ryan sticky bombs and shit. They cannot be employed effectively in places like JRTC because they're worried about M1 Abrams tanks running over dismounts. And so when oh, yeah. they go inside of a close fight, the tank commander removes his miles gear so he cannot be shot. He opens the turret up and he goes like waist high out of the tank. And then the loader gets out and he goes and walks in front of the tank as a ground guide when they're in the urban environment so that the M1 tank doesn't knock a fucking building over. So now you have two people that are your enemy that are outside of the tank that cannot be engaged with small arms fire. So what situational awareness benefit do you get of shooting at a crew and making it button up and close hatches? What benefit do you get of actually spider webbing armored glass in the periscope ports? Look at those Russian tiger uh, MRAPs. They got blowed up in uh they got shot up in that Ukrainian ambush. Look at how spider mark a uh, spider webbed and pockmarked those windshields are. Look back at the old file footage of the 1165 Humvees that we left with the Iraqis that went into Mosul. Every one of them bitches had bullet holes in the glass. That shit is hard to see through. Would you like to drive a car around that has no windshield wipers and somebody throws mud on the on the windshield and you have to navigate and stay on the road in that environment? So these TTPs that absolutely work, they, we knew they worked in World War II and when they, we've known they've worked ever since then. No American soldiers have actually gotten a chance to practice or even see the benefits of those TTPs notionally because the safety margins at our training centers don't allow crunchies to swarm a fucking tank because they're afraid that the blind ass tank crew is going to power turn and run over infantrymen and kill them dead in a training mission. So we have 30 years of infantry on armor combat that is the most hokey bullshit replicates nothing of what a tank and infantry combined arms urban fight should look like because there's no there's no safe way to do good force on force training with tanks and, and infantry without running over infantry. Um, uh, Chuck, wasn't wasn't there a battalion uh, it, incident? Uh, one of the the bats had an engagement with two T seventy twos that a local warlord had. They were hitting a house near his house. He got roused up from that, thought he was being attacked, so he rolled his T seventy twos out. And it was actually a couple strikers. It was one one lower enlisted dude uh, schmucked one of the T seventy twos or popped the track with an AT four. He grabbed two of them out of the striker, and then one of the strikers was loaded with slap tees and actually did some fucking damage to the top of that turret. And same thing, it was the sensors. Once you kill all those those sites, whether by frag or direct hit, um, you take, you know, okay, you've got your periscope. 
if you've ever tried to see what's going on out of a periscope in an armored vehicle, it is uh, terrifying. Yeah. So, I mean, yep. you've got, you've got some point to that. And I, I think that's <clears throat> kind of going back to uh, the disinformation side of thing, at least from the Russian perspective is uh, we were hearing a lot about, and our, one of our biggest concerns was uh, uh, IR energy from our laser range finders and target designators um, and some of the systems the Russians were claiming they had. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of probably stuff that's behind the secret or TSI paywall that comes out of this conflict, depending upon where, where, whether we end up uh, kicking off World War III or not. Um, but it kind of goes back to that where the Russians were debuting, especially a lot of these systems that were on the, the that were, they were showing off on the T-90. Um, you know, there's video upon video with dude to, with a gravelly voice on YouTube about how fucking awesome the T90 is. And it might very well be awesome, but it's also a very expensive tank to produce. Russia hadn't really found buyers for it yet. And it was also showcasing a lot of systems that they directly copied from ours and made more into uh, something that was less concerned with RPGs and more kind of geared towards, you know, main tank open battlefield survivability. But yep. we also didn't know, does it fucking work? And based on the amount of javelins that I'm seeing popping T-72s to T-90s, um, and especially with the Russians building those laughable RPG cages like we used to have on the outside of Strikers, the, the anal bead cage, yeah. um, we, uh, seeing that not work, is uh, it, it kind of punches a lot of holes in the Russian, you know, the Russian messaging because they do it like we do. They, you know, Russian superiority. We're the best. We're good. We're, we, we, our way of war is better. Our technology is good. The Russians bought off on reactive armor really, really heavy. Uh, you know, that's, that's those squares that you see all over the outside of of their main battle tanks. And the last time that we had that shit in our inventory was, uh, probably the M60 A3, the, before the Marines bought the M1. Uh, we might not, we, I think we've got some on the Bradley ODS too, but, but last, our last main battle tank that had reactive armor was the, uh, M60 alpha three, uh, that, that the Marines had during the desert storm conflict before they bought the Abrams. Um, the javelin was designed with a dual, a dual warhead. So it's got, it has a shape charge front and rear. And so when it comes in and hits, it absorbs the, blast from the countermeasure and then fires another jet directly in the same hole coming down the exact same tube on a, on avenue of, of, a, of attack so it was specifically made to defeat threat reactive armor uh so the the other technology that allegedly is out there is active protection and that is what that's what mac is alluding to and I, i'm still waiting to see it I'm still waiting to see the Funker 530 video of the boom, shoot, boom, boom, and hit it before it gets to the vehicle. I want to see a bullet get hit with a fucking bullet because uh, that shit's a lot harder. There's a lot more sciency math to hit an incoming rocket with a countermeasure fired from your vehicle back out at the incoming rocket, uh, which is uh, allegedly what the Russians said that they had perfected. But I, I ain't seen it yet. I see a bunch of busted ass vehicles on the side of the road and I'm not seeing not a single video of a uh, explosion inbound to an armored vehicle by something in the car. There's there's another tech that they were telling that they had kind of, do you remember the, uh, I can't remember what it was called. They had it on some of our uh, Humvees or whatnot, basically like to give you SI where a a bullet shot. Boomerang. Boomerang. Well, they had something they were, showcasing that they had something similar that if a and it was geared towards tank but we weren't sure what the wavelength of light it was targeting but it was geared towards if another tank like an abrams lays a t72 or t80 or t90 it would auto orient the turret in that general direction to make position faster um we were more concerned because it was just general unknown as to whether or not that system was up and running or even capable so it, it's like I said, it's a good showcase for us because a lot of it, a lot of the Russian side of things is tipping their hand by doing all of this. And frankly, I was more worried about the, the I'm, I would be more concerned about the EW side of things that the Russians have than anything else, because we have 
we have real world application and use of that that we can point to where we we've watched them do it. Yeah. And it's it's on some level effective. And it's something that we don't have at the tactical level. Okay. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. So laser designators on armored vehicles or aircraft or whatever, they're nothing new. Going back to the 90s, the Comanche attack helicopter had an offset laser designator. So if it was firing a laser guided missile, it would offset the laser pointer from the vehicle. And then at X amount of seconds to impact, go boop and stick it right on the turret. And by the time the threat warning alarms went off on the armored vehicle, it would be getting smacked with the, with the missile. That technology was built into that reconnaissance helicopter going all the way back to 1995. Um, and uh, so th this whole spy versus spy, like just because it shows up at the DSEI trade show does not mean that instantly it's on everybody's shit. And I hate that, uh, especially when we start talking about arms race on the soldier's back. You want to make the M1 Abrams tanks 80 tons? fucking fine don't show me a front plate that the enemy has that weighs 12 fucking pounds that you know that motherfucker ain't wearing and then go build an entire new battle rifle that lets you carry half the fucking load for the same weight uh to defeat this plate that you know dudes in track suits that sit on top of bmps uh, that I won't even have body armor on as soon as the temperature gets warm over there like that that's that, that is effect. You've effectively reduced the lethality and mobility of the entire U S fighting force by just saying that you have an, a, a, a personnel armor capability that we then think we must defeat. And, uh, and it goes both ways. Some fucking magazine of some bunk ass experimental ammo gets found on a battlefield somewhere. We take it back and test it. Oh my God, it can defeat our sappy plates. Let's make an X sappy plate that's so fucking happy that it's literally never been issued out to anybody in combat. And they I've just seen sit them. I've yeah. seen them and they, they basically sat in a conex. They sit in a warehouse waiting for somebody to get smoked with a magazine of that shit. And it's like, oh my God, the mystery ammo has arrived on the battlefield. Everybody jock up to mop level 90 on your fucking body armor, whatever. Well, and, and it was, I think it was less to do with that. And this is very similar to, um, am I still there? Mm -hmm. um, it, so this kind of goes back to a concept that I read about years ago. Um, uh, and it was, it's fairly obvious because if anybody shit posted online or looked at somebody's shit posts, then you can relate to what this is, but reflexive control. So the, the idea that I'm, triggering a response from my enemy or my target audience, uh, whether that be the opposition of my out group, you know, from in and out group bias and whatnot, or my own side. Um, I'm, I'm jerking off my own side to get them riled up. Um, but it, it reminded me of the, when the Russians came out and made a bunch of claims about the, the new body armor that they had, which shocker, it's not like uh, born carbide plates were going to be, solely the thing that the United States and its allies had for very long once we started the GWAT and things started falling off trucks. Um, but the the whole arms race that the rifle you're talking about kind of started on our side where they were, they were quote unquote, worried about lethality, worried about lethality and like lethality in the, you know, general officer tank mind is I need to be able to punch through armor, but I'm thinking of it in the state of the soldier, the infantry dude. I'm not thinking of how, how much does that actually suck to, or to shoot that battle rifle? How much does it suck to carry that 308, which for a more than a hot minute, they were actually considering building a battle rifle and handing that out as a new army issue sniper or excuse me, not sniper, uh, army issued sidearm, like going full backwards in time to the 1970s where the G3 and the FAL were the rifle of the cold war. Um, mm -hmm. so it, 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 and what tying this all in as far as the reflexive control is being able to spook your opposition into making moves and develop basically putting effort where, and money and treasure and, 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 you know, hand wringing into an area where it is not, really needed um m855a1 
probably would take a couple of rounds to go through a Russian plate. We haven't, unfortunately, we haven't had the opportunity to test it, but it's still going to be better off than the green tip. And yep. frankly, like it, they, they weren't even thinking about like, well, what is this going to do to the ability for the infantry squad to stay in direct contact with said enemy? We've already documented and talked about ad nauseum on, on PNS and amongst ourselves and especially in the military circles. When you looked at the data of the new call, which incorporates a lot of the concepts, the basic concepts that we were learning when, you know, you were probably learning before me, but I learned from, from Pat and people picked up and started going towards the fighting with a gun versus shooting a call. That took 12, 15 years to even come into fruition. And it's a good thing it did, but then we're looking at the data and guys and gals are doing much worse or about the same than they did with the old call. Well, how is handing them a harder to shoot battle rifle with less rounds going to up your lethality? Where's the data in that? It's kind of like the FBI chasing after the, the golden bullet that they can stick in a pistol and then finding out on the human performance side, it really just matters how many times and where you hit them. It, yep. It's always so, kind of, uh, it's boggled my mind that we waste, uh, we waste our time on these things. So I think all of this plays into our conventional assumptions. And I'm not talking about talking up the Russians as fierce fighters. I'm talking about straight numbers and, you know, all of the file footage or the coffee or die videos or vice news or whatever, they all went to that fucking front line um, that had pretty much been stabilized since 2014. And you saw Ukrainians living in some like firebase Restrepo looking bunker trench networks periscopes because you got to watch out for the Russian snipers or whatever. And then you think about the battalion task group with its EW organic capability and BM 21 and, and, and one five, two howitzer capability. And the idea of being able to just nuke all of the fucking grid square where all of these static defenses are at thereby softening up the targets, just like they did in their previous campaigns where they learned. And then the Moscow situation, when you end up running through the battalion task group, it's only two companies of mechanized uh, infantry and a company of tanks. But when you've nuked the entire defense with BM 21s and you roll in there, you're basically dealing with a shell shock Moscow. And, but that's not how we're seeing the BTGs being employed right now on the social media that we can see and that we're not seeing a lot of footage coming out of Donbass. Everything is outside of Kharkiv and Kiev. And I believe some of that is because how can you upload a cell phone video? If your adversary is to control the cell phone network in that area, I think there's probably an inability. And I think that we are getting, we as armchair quarterbacks are getting really, really happy at the, uh, pro wrestling, my, my guy is is winning this wrestling match right now, and I think that there is a reality on the other side of this that the casualties on both sides are mounting heavily, and that's a big ass country. And if we can only show that they haven't taken any of the major cities, but they if they control the entire countryside and the entire highway network. Uh, if they manage to envelop and bypass the cities, they're cut off. All the javelin missiles in the world sitting at the Polish-Ukrainian border aren't going to do any good to a resistance faction inside of Kiev if they can't get those missiles. There has to be, there has to be land convoy routes that the Ukrainians can push log into their country. And every day, even though it gets harder for Putin – Forces that are essentially irreplaceable are being lost on the Ukrainian side. And none of that data is being captured in our OSINT, open source, kill TV, Monday morning quarterback and bullshit that we're doing, watching the internet and trying to battle track a fight. So. Well, that's, that's a, uh, we saw that in uh, a very pronounced difference of 
well, with that and Putin was had at the time with Crimea had the uh, the Kansas City shuffle down pat on that one because he he closed down and effectively blitzkrieged by basically cutting off all lines of communication simultaneously or almost it might as well as be simultaneous. It completely fell apart for the Ukrainians. Do I think the Ukrainians have learned since then? Oh fuck yeah. Um, the the difference for me watching this is uh, stuff is still getting out. And I know it's not going to be the whole picture. So you're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, like S2 Underground is a very good uh, mm -hmm. open source Intel analyst yep. brief that kind of brings all that stuff together. But he's sanguine about the, the what he doesn't know. And he's very obviously saying, I cannot say anything about what's going on in Kiev or Kiev, as you, or you, you guys already discussed. But um, I can't really speculate what's going on there, what the, the, the numbers of casualties are, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That being said, there's another factor of this that I think a lot of Americans aren't quite um, aware of. And I mean, this is this is how NATO is going to fight this. NATO is not going to, NATO's never, any of the NATO nations that are on the border between Belarus, like Poland, uh, like the, the, the you know, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Scandinavian countries that are part of NATO, even the ones that aren't, um, they're not going to sit there and duke it out face to face with Russia. They're going to fight a delaying action waiting for, you know, you know, big hungry, i.e. the United States to rally and meet them at the line. Um, so it's, I think in some respects, Ukraine's kind of figured that out and they're, they're making this, even if they know they are probably going to lose in the long run, they're going to make Putin bleed for every single inch of ground. I think they believe they're going to lose in the medium run. I think they've had a better, I think almost all of us can agree that things did not go as lightning war as we thought things were going to go. Like the battalion task group scares the shit out of me. I would not want to be in a place where I can't even use my omnidirectional VHF radios that are on my vehicles, because if I key up, they're going to fucking hammer me okay dig a foxhole dig a bunker thermal barrack rockets they're gonna crush me with overpressure whether they hit my bunker or not blast frag means nothing in a thermal barrack environment they're gonna fucking suck the air right out of my lungs with near misses whether i'm buttoned up not buttoned up in a bunker not in a bunker they're gonna take the very air out of my lungs um and like I said, maybe those guys that were out there in, in the Donbass region and those fucking trench lines that all the media had been going into for the past several months, maybe every one of them dudes is dead now. We have no idea of knowing. We have no I've, way of knowing. I've got a question for, you know, I don't mean to shift topics so abruptly, but I had a question for Yancey uh, if he's here. Yeah, right here. Um, because you sound like you have a lot more uh, – Weirdly enough, when I was uh, for the nine months I was in Poland, other than the territorial defense group guys that we kind of linked up with and started working with, um, who they use the Canadian sniper school as their training ground, both both of their their active militaries, because I don't think they have a at least not for the general purpose guys, um, but they also don't have USAR, so they don't have the protections for like reservists or national guards when he goes the fuck away to on on orders and his jobs there when he gets back or she gets back. So getting people to school was a very big deal uh, for them. And it was hard because they'd have like two or three guys that are trained. Um, so getting to train with us was a big deal for them. Cause it's like, what you, you're telling me you've got majority of your sniper section has actually been school trained and had some experience. Um, anyway, uh, my question was, is what's the, what is the, the, the upside bottom side of Putin going full scorched earth with some of these cities? Cause it seems like he's trying. And I, I believe what you guys are saying about Putin making some out of character moves with this by just invading in the first place. Um, but at the same time, the strategy seems to be at least from what we can gather OSINT seems to be that they are trying as best they can to not just absolutely, because they could just go full, you know, full scorched earth in all these cities, but they have to, 
they have to rule this place when they're done. And uh, if that, yeah, they're going to have to own it, right? I mean, yeah, that's that's how you get a long term insurgency. I mean, yeah. we should know that by now. Fuck. I'm kind of surprised in a, in a number of things. I'm surprised that he recognized the two republics as we uh, stated earlier, and then did a Hail Mary pass around through Belarus to attack uh, Kiev directly. Didn't see that coming. Um, as of yesterday or uh, last week, Monday, uh, even up to uh, Wednesday evening, I was like, I, I still don't see him attacking the whole country, but he ended up doing it anyways. But what I'm wondering also, because we're not really seeing that much scor scorched earth policy of what they're capable of, especially with, uh, as Chuck alluded to, the, uh, the thermobaric weapons, that uh, one tracked vehicle that looks like it's got a Katusha uh, system mounted on it, the TOS-1. TOS um, they're in theater, they're, they're, they're being used, but um, I just printed out a map so I can compare it uh, tomorrow. It's off of the, uh, uh, what is it? The uh, the live map, Ukrainian live map, and it shows the areas in red of where the uh, the Russians have pushed in, and uh, we were there we're well past the seventy two hour mark, and they really haven't gained that much uh, territory. Uh, the territories on the in the in the two breakaway republics, yeah, that's pretty much it's this it's 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 taken it's seized but they have an overwhelming russian majority there to ensure that it's going to be and they push the ukrainian units out of it what i'm almost wondering is with the limited amount of territory that they have been able to seize coming in from belarus towards kiev and south from crimea uh past kyrson in in ukraine is that have they already overextended themselves logistically because I, I watched a, a live cam uh, at uh, on the Crimean border, and I seen a, a huge Russian column come through there. I was like, okay, it's it's uh, this is this has got to be a, a reinforced battalion. All these BMDs, um, BTRs, and stuff like that coming through, and I'm like, okay, where's the where's the battalion trains? Nope, it's not a battalion. It's a reinforced brigade that I'm seeing through. Okay. Oh, there's some trains, logistics trucks and stuff like that. Water, a water truck. I've seen a water truck, a water truck, but I didn't see any fuelers. Like we didn't do our thunder runs in the in uh, UE being the you know third entry division. They they did their thunder runs in in the Baghdad uh, to one to do a kind of a shock and awe uh, on the ground, but they had fuelers to back up the trucks, uh, to back up the tanks and everything. I'm not seeing a whole lot of lo logistics stuff coming through here. I'm seeing like good sized columns, uh, all armored vehicles, uh, BMDs. Uh, uh, T-72s, trucks that he's seen, some T-80s. I haven't seen. I've seen some faraway pictures. Can't really discern what it, what it is. Maybe a T-80. But I've seen like a lot of stuff that doesn't have logistic support at, in, in the form of fuelers. And I'm reading and, and seeing some social media stuff where like there, there's like these Ukrainian dudes showing up and towing away a tank with a, with his tractor. And I'm like, it's just, it just ran out of gas. I mean, is this, uh, is, are you guys seeing anything like this? Uh, two days ago, I was seeing uh, like a, a Snapchat where a Ukrainian who's got balls of steel was pulled up and was just, Kind of joking with the Russians. He's like, hey "Guys, you lost." <laughs> yeah, you got. No, do you guys? Uh, do you got? What? Do you guys break down? He's like, "No, I ran out of gas." He's like, "You need to tow back to Russia." And there's a little bit of chuckling, and then uh, yeah, but it was like it was kind of. This was a line of uh, BMPs. Like the entire column, either ran out of gas, like two vehicles ran out of gas, or the entire column, roughly around the same area, just went blue and died. So they've been moving a, a roughly about the same distance, and I mean, there's uh, several T80 you know, groups that look like they've broken down or, uh, been captured like whole. And yeah. it, some of that, I wonder is like, there was a picture of a, a T80 or T90 where you can see where the, the headsets have been ditched. Like the crew ran out of gas, realized they were separate. And these are like lone T80s and, uh, uh, BTRs or, you know, APCs in general that are like roaming around, uh, Russians raiding, raiding grocery stores for food, uh, which, I mean, that, that's just battlefield scavenging. But at the same time, like if you've got a lone tank roaming around that lone tank has to know that's how tanks go to die. 
Yeah, I mean, we saw that we saw that in in Iraq when uh, the Iraqis ran their armored column in, trying to scare off ISIS, and got got their shit pushed in, um, especially into a city. But I I don't know, and it's it's hard to get a tr- total sense of how much of this is actually, you know, the Ukrainians seeing the opportunity for a great propaganda, uh, you know, push. And how much of this is just the general fog of war? Because we know that even in the invasion part two of Iraq, there was logistics fuckery and bad calls all the way around. Um, we just managed to, through our redundancy, to make up for it. I mean, your your average commander, even if they're completely incompetent, are not going to leave leave behind their fuel trucks, let alone their water trucks. Yeah, they might I mean, leave behind an entire LMTB full of munitions, but. Yeah, this the size of that unit that crossed uh, over from Crimea was was pretty damn big, and I, I I seen logistics trucks probably had chow and ammo on it uh, maybe, um, I didn't see any ambulances, and they mark them same way that we do, uh, but put crosses on them and stuff. Uh, I didn't see any ambulances. I didn't see uh, any fuelers, and I seen one water truck, and that was for uh, a brigade. It had to have been a brigade. This the sheer number of BMDs and, and BTRs that were on that. Um, there was a lot of Ewo stuff on uh, on a couple of the BTRs. So it was either uh, uh, command tra- uh, command APCs or uh, 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 electronic warfare sort of uh, setups, which is, is in all likelihood is is probably the the case. Um, but, uh, like some of the stuff that I'm seeing, uh, with the units pushing in from the North coming down through Belarus, uh, in, in the, into Ukraine, I'm not seeing a lot of logistic support on that either. And again, I'm just wondering if, if it's, if their, if their, uh, operation has somewhat stalled because of logistics. Well, and, uh, if, if the, if the Ukrainian units were smart, that would be where they, you know, basically, because they know they can't win on a toe to toe to right. toe. Face, face hang, back, hang back, hide up, you know, camouflage your shit as best you can against the drones, turn them off. So it gets, it gets cold, um, hang in the trees. Cause we, we right. discovered even in the, that coverage of the Polish forest, if you get deep enough in those forests and you turn your truck off and let everything go cold, uh, unless you can get visually spotted by a, a, like a helicopter, like an Apache, Good fucking luck actually finding it unless you send in infantry to go, you know, suss them out. Yeah, um, there's a really good article that a buddy of mine posted up on LinkedIn. It's called uh, Feeding the Bear, a closer look at Russian army logistics and a fait accompli. Um, I'll uh, I'll put that as a, uh, I'll send you guys a link to it if you're interested on on uh, Facebook Messenger. It's, it looks like it's a, it's a really good article. Definitely something to, to consider based on what this map is showing me right now. And I'll compare it again, say tomorrow afternoon, see if there's been any gains or, or losses in, in, in red uh, colored territory. Yeah, this, this whole thing's gonna get, get interesting because it's, uh, like I said, I, I, I don't see what, Russia had more to gain by pushing their their whole idea of superiority and continuing to develop their their military because like Chuck was in both you and Chuck were discussing earlier. Uh, I was listening. I just I went for a run because it was the only opportunity I was going to get. Um, the 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 amount of intelligence gained here and whether or not the Russians will even be able to say like say this doesn't go awesome for them and the mid range turns into a long term campaign. They can't really just start dropping skyscrapers, you know, a la Modern Warfare 2. Because, um, like you said, you, you still have to govern the people. And what what sense is putting in a puppet government if the entire populace, who, even though they might have been ethnic Russians, fucking hates your guts. Like, and is going to do everything possible to undermine you or assassinate you, like, in every yeah. term. Like, all it's going to do is just be a spiraling shit show where the Russian backed, you know, police military is going to come in, put down the revolt and it's going to spiral. And then you're going to end up with a humanitarian crisis, literally circa, you know, Ukraine underneath USSR rule where they starve them. Yeah. Um, Ukraine is roughly about the size of Texas. It's just a little bit smaller than the size of Texas. Now, Texas is a big ass state. If you ever driven down, uh, get driven, driven through Texas on I-10 shit, it takes like three days to get through Texas. 
uh, and that's, that's, that's hauling ass, you know, but, uh, uh, the Ukrainians and Ukraine itself is, uh, a good, a good chunk, if not a majority of the land battles during World War II, uh, the more famous ones were in the Ukraine. And they had a, a very active partisan um, history in, in, in fighting, not only fighting initially the Red Army after the revolution and uh, the, 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 uh, the Russian, uh, so, the Civil War in, in the newly formed Soviet Union at that time. And basically what was used as a weapon to bring Ukraine into, the, into its fold, into the Soviet Union's uh, fold, was hunger, was absolute mass starvation. And they starved them into submission. And that was and also where you had the control of East West Germany, where really we couldn't, it's not like before where they had basically that entire part of Europe. You know, there was, there was no, you know, Romania, Slovenia, uh, Hungary, Poland, et cetera. It was all those, those States, but they might as well have been Russian. Yeah. At least in the control. So it's not, it's not like the same circumstance where they could do that and get away with it as easily. No, no. Um, and not, not in today's world, not with everybody having a, a smartphone with uh, internet access and being able to post things. And uh, it'll be hard for them to get away with uh, a lot of things that I think uh, on the Russian side are, they're, they're hoping to uh, keep it quiet. It's going to be impossible to do so. So it remains to be seen. It remains to be seen. I think the next, uh, Next few days, I don't want to give it a timeline because I've, I've, I've been proven wrong. But like I was saying, last night at around 1900 local time was a 72-hour benchmark. And I'm looking at it, you know, 24 hours later. And uh, like I said, not a sizable amount of, uh, of, of land that's been taken in the time frame that, we, that they've had. So, again, I think it's a question of, uh, of logistics that's definitely coming into play here. We'll see if uh, they get resupplied uh, tonight or tomorrow and where, where, the, where the push goes. And I'll compare the map from that I just printed out to, uh, say, uh, uh, noontime here, and we'll, we'll see what, what's, what's, what's been happening. I've been watching carefully the, uh, the moon phases. They, they, they're not much for fighting at night, clearly, because it doesn't seem like a, a whole lot of uh, stuff happens at night other than barrages and airstrikes. But uh, as far as like maneuver and stuff like that and fighting on the ground, there's not a whole lot that's been going on. So uh, it's mostly during the day. So I've been I've been watching the weather, uh, the moon phases and and other things like that, just to see like what what's what, what's going on. And they had a uh, like literally the night that the uh, operation kicked off, uh, they had a. Uh, uh, it was the first night of a, of a, of a waning moon phase. It was waxing up until then. So I bet it was pretty bright at night and, uh, they, they wanted the cover of darkness to, to do their deeds. So again, we'll, uh, in the next, uh, the next few days, it's, uh, they either, they're either going to come to the negotiating uh, table, but again, I think Putin as Chuck and I have alluded to is, is not going to be able to be talked to. He's not going to be irrational enough to, to, uh, call this call an end to this because there's there's a prestige and there's image that he and his uh, huge uh, ego that is going to have to uh, be uh, satiated and i don't think it's going to be i i, I wasn't really thinking of that too because i was thinking same old putin but uh i was thinking he had a different uh kind of listen to what you guys said it made more sense because somebody else mentioned that to me to, today or yesterday and uh I didn't really consider it because I hadn't I had it's been moving so quickly that while I was there before this invasion was watching it essentially develop as I was, you know, demobilizing and then watching it get kicked off, like literally. Let's see, I got back within four days of getting back home, which whew, at least I'm not in the canary in the coal mine in East Poland. Um, the uh, watching myself watching this kick off, like within days of me leaving that region um it's moved relatively quickly i kept i keep thinking that poland or i kept thinking that putin had some agenda that he wasn't really sharing uh or he had he had something on deck some master scheme that he hadn't really that people hadn't dialed in on but the more i think about it i wonder what he has to gain by doing this unless this is con thinking of him in the way he normally is, you know, or he has been like, 
it wouldn't be surprising if uh, if it was a grand deal to cause a giant kerfuffle on one side of the world and then let China, which is his new partner, you know, that's that's not an, un, an unknown secret right now, uh, his new partner in crime to be able to go do what they want to do in Taiwan and make us choose and keep us occupied. But I also don't see what the way their economy already is. China's economy is on the cusp of it. And frankly, if you look at history of sanctions, sanctions haven't done a lot with preventing countries that are earmarked as being overly aggressive or not exactly friends of the free world um, have not had a great history if we look back to World War II with Japan at preventing conflict. So I, I, I wonder why, I guess it's the, look, I tried to do something, you know, so we're going to war now. But I wonder why people keep insisting upon sanctions as a way to affect somebody's decision making when obviously it has not. I mean, it, yeah. it, uh, take into example the, the Japanese during World War II, um, they felt that with the death blow that they dealt with uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, I, I read, I believe, it was uh, Anthony. Bevoir, uh, he writes historical books about World War II. And basically, the Japanese realized that if they didn't have a huge victory within the first six months of World War II kicking off with the United States, that they were going to lose. And they fought tenaciously island to island to island to island until we, uh, the United States was was uh, on, on its doorstep in Okinawa and then contemplating uh, an invasion of the mainland of Japan would have cost, uh, I believe Truman uh, was told that it would be roughly 2 million lives to take mainland Japan because they would fight very tenaciously. Yeah. And the decision was made to, to, to ultimately drop the nukes on the two cities. Um, I, I, I really, again, no tell on what on earth is, is this plan. Uh, the Russian folks that I've speak with, spoke, spoken with, friends of mine, uh, I'm like, what's the guy's end game? And they're like, none of us, none of us can even fathom what, what, what his end game is. Um, is, Rus is Russia's economy doing so poorly and their agriculture doing so poorly? Are they viewing Ukraine, which is a breadbasket, it was the breadbasket for the for the former Soviet Union. Uh, it's roughly at the same uh, elevation as what, say, Wisconsin is um, for us here in the United States. But that is where a good chunk of the world's wheat supply comes from. That's about that's about it. Uh, it and well, 90 they've got a lot more uh, mineral resources too that exactly. not being really tracked. And that's that, that's what is primarily in those two republics that broke away the Lugansk and uh, Donbass region. It's coal, metal, and metallurgy. Uh, there's a lot of that uh, that's been somewhat decimated because of the, of the war going on there since 2014. But it's like it's it's almost like a Tom Clancy novel. If you look at the whole thing, it's like is something going on in, in Russia where they feel that they have to conquer this country to get its resources and bring it into the folds of the Russian Federation. That is what's kind of, kind of interesting. And God, I wish Tom Clancy were still alive and he could write a, a summary novel on uh, red storm rising. Uh, it would be something to, to look at. I don't know what they're, I don't know what I, I haven't thought to look at it, but I'll make a note here to look at it and see what, Russia's ag agricultural uh, output has been for the last uh, few years and see like, is it declining? Is it getting worse? Is something happening that they're not getting enough rain or moisture in certain areas? I mean, so they have snow, but that's about it. Like well, what it could is- be, Well, it could be a commodities and I, I apologize for interrupting you. It could be just as, cause it, nothing's been hammered more in the news to include coming out of the, you know, press releases coming out of the white house than talking about how Russia's economy is intrinsically linked to the petrodollar and to their natural gas deals and stuff like that. Um, I could see them wanting to, if their economy is so intrinsically linked to that, I mean, that's why I bet if Saudi Arabia had more diversification, they'd probably be a little bit more um, aggressive with how they uh, exert power in their region. Um, I could see Russia wanting to in a weird way, diversify their portfolio um, of natural resources that they have that they can turn around and export. Because like the second biggest iron mine 
in the world is in Ukraine. Um, obviously, all, like you said, all that's been disrupted, um, but it's one of those uh, that might be part of it. I mean, we're looking at the whole semiconductor issue with Taiwan. You know, that's the world's producer of semiconductors. Uh, that's if not only if that gets disrupted by full scale warfare, and I know we're kind of shifting off topic, but or if that gets taken is now controlled by our, you know, uh, our, our, our economic partner in, you know, our economic frenemy, but uh, also our regional, you know, or global enemy in China, then, you know, and I, I am by no means a expert on any of this. This is just, you know, what I've gleaned just looking at the whole problem. Uh, I haven't been able to answer uh, two, two, two different clumped questions with respect, with respect to Putin and this whole thing. What does he gain and what does he lose by invading? And what does he lose and what does he gain by not invading? And obviously the not invading one, I just shoved that one, you know, into the trash bin. And now I'm just trying to figure out what he gains by this, because if it goes poorly for him, it could be the Afghanistan war part two for him. And they're not exactly equipped to soak up the materials, treasure, and blood loss like they were, uh, excuse me, like we were with respect to the GWAT. And we comparatively didn't lose that many lives. I bet right now you're probably looking at close to the first 10 years of Afghanistan and Iraq in casualties on both sides right now uh, that we're not seeing just because the information's not getting out there. Yeah, I uh, oh, I found the... Uh, well, I'm trying to, I got like a million windows open right here. I'm just trying to find the one that I had, but I had the, uh, there we go. Okay. All right. Uh, right now I'm showing, and again, this comes from the UK Ministry of Defense, and it's on the Wikipedia page, uh, 644 Russian dead. Um, hasn't been updated. Um, got to be more than that. Yeah, I'm thinking that it has to be, but I'm skeptical at the other number that I've seen of uh, a four thousand dead. I'm skeptical of that. What's what's the weather been like? Because I know that was the biggest thing that uh, the weather's been a contingent aspect of them. It didn't, being get, able to move it didn't their, get as their, cold as they wanted. Yeah, you think that's what slowed some of their movement, like where you've seen a lot of these these uh, armored columns moving on roads on, versus on road. being... yeah yep because i've mm. seen some i've seen some tanks in dirt and they were they were they were churning up mud per, pretty good in the videos i saw yeah. so not not exactly hard packed frozen farm fields that they were hoping for uh across across the land well even in yeah. Poland, it was unusually warm that winter yeah I was watching, uh, especially the the Donbass and uh, Lugansk regions on on weather, weather dot com, and again looking at the uh, uh, moon phases and all of this, and those areas which I was thinking was was were going to be the the main thrust. You know, they recognize the two areas, move in, secure them. Okay, you're part of Russia now. Everything's good. But then they, they did the hell Mary and did everything else that I didn't think that they would do, but up leading up until division or invasion night or invasion day uh i didn't see snow falling i seen rain falling and ukraine was known uh in world war ii that to have a season that whenever the snow starts to melt they call it uh the 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 season without roads because the whole place turns into a, a big turny fucking swampy shitty muddy mess and as soon as they, as soon as, like Chuck was right, as soon as these tanks pull off those hard balls, boom, they get bogged down to the to the Jensen boxes, you know. Yeah, this is was, making uh, me. Oh, I was just going to quickly say uh, this is making me want to go find an article from Hardcore History or a, an episode covering the beginnings of World War II to find out. Okay, how did Europe react to Hitler initially? And do we have any some similarities here? It it, ta it yeah. takes a, it takes a little while to figure out like holy shit like what this, is this guy this doing is really this is really yeah. happening right 
I mean, even remember like the week prior when Biden, of course, the right side media was playing that 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 Biden and the government was talking up this war shit. And even Putin's like, oh, yeah, the West is trying to spook you guys. And we had the Ukrainian president like, oh, yeah, we're supposed to get invaded. Like it was all a big fucking joke um, to them until like the night of the long knife started. And they're like, holy shit, the U.S. like was really giving us solid intelligence and they weren't feeding us, you know, pointed intelligence to get us to do what they wanted. Um, that's, uh, it, it's going to take a little while. Hey, so going back to um, <clears throat> what you guys were saying about why, uh, there is a historical precedent between Soviet and Russian um, political stuff and the price of oil. So uh, when the oil prices are high, if there are military aspirations, it's kind of like us when we want to buy new guns, but we're poor. Like when we get an influx of cash, oh, look, it's the tax return. Uh, instead of sticking it in a savings account, we go out and buy a gun with it. And the Russians kind of have a history of doing that, but with military aspirations, they fund wars with an increase of oil revenue. The oil revenue at this level, it pays for all the bills. But when the oil prices go up to here, all this, this is this is all monies. And instead of buying a new gun, I'm going to take a new province with this shit. And uh, so I'm looking at an article from uh, The Economist uh, from back in 2021. Um, so when the Helsinki Accords got signed with the West in 1975, price of oil was um, down at 50 bucks a barrel. Then it spikes. And when they invaded Afghanistan, the price of oil was $101 a barrel back at 79, right? Then it goes all the way down and, and during Gorbachev's years and during the fall of the Soviet Union, shit's about 30 something bucks a gal, uh, barrel. Uh, then it goes down even further down to $19 a barrel in like 98 and the Russians have the ruble crisis. So really dark days for the Soviet economy or the Russian economy. Then the shit spikes back up. 2008, it peaks at 105-ish dollars a fucking barrel in 2008 during the housing crisis. And Russia Georgia. invades fucking Georgia. And then it dips back down and it goes down to about $60 a barrel and uh, President Obama has the relations reset with uh, Secretary Clinton in 2009. Then the shit spikes back up again, and they go to annex Crimea when the shit's between $80 and $90 a barrel again. Then it crashes, and now it's but peaked back up into a spike. So every time that we have these super, super high gas prices, there is a correlation with military action uh, the one, the one um, exception to that rule was 2010, 2011, when the price of oil went up to almost $120 a barrel. Uh, they, they didn't, they didn't fuck anything up in 2010 or 2011. They skipped that that spike in oil prices. But every major spike in oil price has had some type of corresponding foreign policy shenanigans uh, involved. So. Yeah. Heard the same thing. <laughs> so good uh, by us um, by us closing our Keystone pipeline because that because that have precipitated them doing this. Well, certainly, probably they took that into consideration. I would I would guess. <clears throat> See, we we as Americans played checkers and Uno, and the Russians played played chess, and uh, they're they're looking six to eight moves ahead. You know, okay, they're probably checking off boxes. Oh, the Americans closing closing down Keystone. Oh, they're going to close down this other pipeline between Canada and, and Michigan. Huh? Okay, check those boxes. That's part of the. That's that's part of it. Oh, oil oil is starting to climb. Uh, we'll make some money here for a while and then kick off our next adventure. And I'm I'm thinking Chuck is 100 percent right on with this. So just because we were an oil exporter under president trump doesn't mean that we didn't buy any russian oil i don't know if, yeah 
And so we had Keystone and Keystone was going to replace or was going to have a larger amount of oil than what we buy from Russia by about a third of a million barrels more. But not all oil is the same. Like Iraqi crude is shit crude compared to other types of crude. So depending on what you're using petroleum for, if you're only going to refine it to a certain level for certain petrol petroleum products or plastics, you can probably buy shittier crude because it doesn't need to be refined to the same level or have the same level. Of crude. This is not on about, but uh, it's common sense 101. If I can get cheap oil and I only need cheap oil to do X, Y, or Z, then, then I might buy that. Even if my oil that I can produce in my own country is better oil, I, I might be able to sell my better oil, export it, make more money for it that way, and then buy somebody else's cheap oil and refine that shit for my shitty processes. Um, and, and so it's not a zero sum game of, this is what America makes and this is what America uses. And so we have an oil surplus. Uh, so the, to say that shutting down Keystone Pipeline automatically funded Putin and that we wouldn't have been funding Putin if there wasn't a Keystone Pipeline, it, it, that's not a direct, I, I think, argument that can be made. I think it's a, no. more, new, it's a more nuanced approach than that. It no, does no, that's not what you. I was saying. Uh, I was more talking about the uh, if they already had that kind of jump to conclusions, Matt, set up where it's like, okay, this is where what if the if the next president does X, such as shutting down those two pipelines, we've already got an assessment of what our situation is going to be, and it's going to lead us on this flow chart towards this goal that we either want or we don't want. That, that's kind of what I was getting at, meaning like they already had it kind of had this mapped out. And this was kind of like what Yancey was saying, as far as it may have been in their playbook that they're shuffling through going, OK, yeah, that's Operation, you know, you know, Operation Corva. You know, here we go. And um, they probably pulled that out of the book. And also probably, I don't know, maybe it's just speculation, perhaps naive speculation, but Perhaps we buy the Russian oil to keep it out of the hands of, of the Chinese. The Chinese have already said, hey, Russia, whatever you want to sell to us, we'll gladly absorb whatever, whatever. Um, maybe that's that's a, that's a case. Maybe that's a, a thought. Who knows? Well, if also, you got if, if our need for their oil is so great and it might stop us from directly intervening and we don't have that, that Keystone pipeline, what are we going to do? We need right. the oil. And I, I, I mean, obviously, the the Biden, um, or excuse me, the left's green zealots, the the eco terrorists, they want they want the price of gas to be ten dollars a gallon, because they believe that they can price the U.S. out of its out of its use of fossil fuels. Um, and if they can make somebody get their fat ass on a bike instead of getting in their car, they're saving the planet. Uh, that that's how radical these people are. Um, so that that's the simple, well, why don't we just not buy oil from them? And if that fucking hits us in the old supply chain, then president Biden has to go before the American people and plead his case. And it's just like, sorry, you can't have any fucking chocolate in world war two. This is for the war effort Buy war bonds. Um, it, it, he's got to make that case of, I'm sorry, I fucked you. You're paying high energy prices right now because fuck Russia. And he's unwilling to do that. And the eco-terrorists the eco -terrorist would love for him to do that. So I want to know if the squad is on board uh, and the eco-terrorists are on board, why in the fuck is this administration not shut off the oil bank, SWIFT, like all of that. Why do we? Why are we having selected sanct uh, sanctions that are leaving the energy sector alone instead of just tightening our belt buckle, tightening our belt up, and getting into a period of austerity until we can get our domestic production ramped back up and fucking tell them, telling the Russians to eat a dick on, on their oil. And um, it's probably because 
in the mind of the eco terrorists, some other country fucking up their environment and landscape pumping it out of the ground is better than us fucking up our landscape and fracking it out of the ground. That's just kind of the twisted mind of the eco terrorist. But we, we, we are not, we are still fighting these sanctions with one arm tied behind our back. And if we either, we either don't like what this guy's doing or not, but uh, I don't think people understand what a big deal it is, how anti-war Germans are. They were bred. Everybody that's an adult German now, from the time they were a child, they were shamed that somewhere in their history, some bad people did some bad stuff and we can't ever let it happen again because we managed to fuck it up twice in one century. We can't be trusted to be nationalists. We can't be trusted to be patriotic about our country. We can't be trusted to have a professionalized standing army that that's powerful because history has shown we're going to fuck that up. And so for the Germans to stand there and it was moderates because the guy was talking, giving his speech and he was like, you can look in the room right now and see who's clapping and who's not. And the far left, they weren't happy. And the ultra right, they weren't fucking happy. And the entire middle was saying, fuck yeah, let's get the band back together and rebuild the Bundeswehr. And that was a huge, huge thing for the Germans to do politically. And 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 it's just lost on the average American because we don't know how bad we fucked those people up by conquering them. They were a conquered fucking people. They lost their nation for fucking half a century, chopped in two by players outside of their own political influence. And we gave their shit back to them and said, we'll be watching you. And, and now we, we, we basically bred fighting spirit out of them. They're just a bunch of fucking betas. Um, and, And so for them to stand up, just like the Japanese, like, yep, I know we had it in our constitution that we can only have this Japanese defense force, but fuck China full speed ahead fucking let's build us a navy because we can't trust the americans are gonna have our back we're watching nations that we kept under our thumb for over half a century get their own voice and step up and uh that's huge and we can't even be bothered to tell uh putin like dude you've lost your fucking mind like we've played nice for two two decades We've played, we've played well with one another, but your shit cannot stand, bro. Fucking, we'll find a half million gallons from barrels from somewhere else. We'll go that's, talk to the, we'll go talk to the fucking Arabs. That's where so, I think he's actually like, he's lost it. Meaning like that yeah. he, he, his, his, his mind, at least the way it's always worked. He's been very careful with, uh, with the moves he's made. Like you said, it's like, as long as I'm in power and I got money, you know, and I'm continuing to build my power base and I'm not in any danger of getting voted out of office. I'll put down a protest here, a political dissident here, you know, shoot a reporter there. I mean, that's, we kind of expect that from him and we kind of let him get away with it in exchange for, Hey, don't, don't be a dickhead. We'll let you keep your, you know, we'll, we'll let you keep your sand castle. We won't kick it over. Um, but by doing this, he's essentially shown why, Trump and other people who were saying it in nicer words, but were saying the right stuff regarding the, the issues with NATO and us essentially handling all of the security by proxy. You know, the ages of, of NATO is basically the ages of the United States, making sure that NATO stays NATO. And in some ways, it I don't know if it have long reaching consequences. It'll probably be a point where uh, uh, I am dead and gone and I probably won't see it. But if if people like Germany or some of the bigger nations in inside of like the main powers inside of the EU can actually start to uh, realize that, Hey, we need more of a, a fighting force. And like, I was blown away by the fact that UK, the two Apaches they had in Poland two made up like almost half of their close air support capability in terms of helos. Like, People don't think about that. Like they have 12, I'm not talking 12 in Poland, 12 Blackhawks for their entire fucking army. Their army itself is only 60,000 people, their army. And if you consider the 
one in seven. I don't know what their model's like, but like for the United States, like one seven to every grunt, there's seven people that, you know, work to keep that grunt fighting. Then if you have an army that's like 60, 70,000 strong, that's only like 10,000 fighting men and women. Period. So it, in some ways, Putin's kind of screwed himself because his whole, his whole rhetoric was centered around, and I might be completely off base because I am not a geopolitical dude at all. Um, I'm just the, you know, the, the grunt with a little bit too much whiskey sometimes. Um, but when, if he's talking about NATO being too aggressive uh, or he's worried or he's claiming that he's worried about NATO being aggressive and uh, putting troops along their border, blah, 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 blah. First of all, if anybody knows anything like that, we, we didn't have a significant amount of fighting power by comparison to the 260,000 troops that they had arrayed in that general Western Russian region. Um, second of all, he might have done exactly what long term what he thinks or he was claiming that he was you know responding to, which is NATO aggression, which he knows as well as anybody else. NATO is a predominantly defensive organization. Like we don't go on the offensive until we get poked. But it's so, it sounds like it, okay. So there are some strategic shit, and there are people making uh, associations to spheres of influence, and like Cuba. And it's like, all right, hey, America, like you got to look at it from the Russian side of view. Um, we, after the fall of the Cold War, have done nothing but but expand NATO for, further uh, towards Russia, and, and it's viewed at as as a threat, right? Um, and when we look at Cuba, we did not prevent the Soviets from establishing communist Cuba. We allowed that to happen. We did not intervene militarily and prevent Cuba from becoming communist. Did we finance the Bay of Pigs? Sure we did. But when nuclear missiles were put in our sphere of influence, we almost went to a nuclear war over it, hence the Cuban Missile Crisis. So there was a way, and th this is what I'm talking about, that thug life. Thug to thug, President Trump and President Putin could have come up with a way that we could ensure the security of the Ukrainian ground with assurances that theater air defense a la nuclear anti-ballistic missile systems or offensive systems or forward-based U.S. troops would not be in Ukraine. Because geographically, like uh, Yancey was saying, um, the last of your channelized terrain is in Ukraine. Once you get out of Ukraine and you cross over to the Russian border, it's a fucking parking lot to Moscow and Leningrad. Um, and it's yeah, yeah. It's classic maneuver warfare, Operation Barbarossa shit. And so Putin's talking about the Ukraine as a buffer because he doesn't want us to forward stage guys on the past this channelizing terrain, past the mountains, past the river crossings, and have them staged where they could just like boop right up into Moscow, right? There's ways that you can show your adversary these guys are under our protection, but not use their, their place as a safe house for, or a jump off point for strategic advantage. After the Cuban Missile Crisis was over, we removed fucking nukes out of Turkey. Turkey was a NATO ally. We had four fucking missiles in their sphere of influence. And when they fucking shut down and blinked at the blockade and all of that happened and we all stepped back from DEFCON 2, very quietly, we stroked off Brezhnev and we took nuclear missiles out of Turkey to lower the temperature, to alleviate those types of strategic concerns. And that was a conversation that never happened. Putin wanted no NATO, no NATO. And it's like, yo, dog, they're their own country. They can fucking try to do whatever even though we have we have an admissions clause because ain't nobody wants to get no grandfathered fucking Article 5 and have to go fight some dude, uh, f fight for some dude. 
th- there's a clause that you can't be in part of NATO if you in the middle of a fucking fight. So as long as they had those occupied troops in those two states, they weren't they they didn't meet criteria to get into fucking NATO anyway. That's, uh, that's, what like, kind of, that's what kind of made me scratch my head. Like, I understood why he did Crimea, because that set the stage to prevent Ukraine from ever going into NATO. Right. What what scratch what like made me kind of like uh, I was a little bit flummoxed by the whole like, well, then what does he gain by doing this? Because I get the whole strategic depth aspect of of the terrain side of things. It's just like just like Poland, that that place has a land of a thousand fucking lakes and rivers. It's it makes the striker with its inability to be amphibious and cross that you know stream um, kind of suck, uh, at least in that that terrain. Um but the 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 aspect of that that it was like did they did they have that discussion going okay by doing this win or lose by doing this we could actually cause the germanies the, the polands the french the spanish the brits and some of those scandinavian states to go oh oh fuck we need an actual like standing military that if we band together in nato and we don't have to wait for the united states to get roused can actually, you know, at least hold their own, not be, you know, a carrier group that's one carrier group to that one hypersonic missile from the Russians. And well, there goes, there goes the British Navy. Well, who's traditionally been the enemy of the Russians for the last 50, 60 years? Us. Us. But Us. They're, so- they're also, they're also the idea that we were doing the things that they were doing um, the rhetoric didn't match the scope of what he was he was proclaiming. Well, like we didn't even move into Ukraine until mm-hmm. they basically invaded Crimea. We weren't even in Ukraine in significant numbers. We were there basically just and it was we were putting National Guard units in there and doing teaching for you know Ukrainian units and sending them out to the front. We weren't well, really like supplying them with materials or doing what we're doing now. Like all he, they've done is amplify the temperature. He's he's calling a bluff. He's making our current administration look weak. He's making all of our allies question our ability to help. He's making, yeah, he's destabilizing our influence. Hey, and if, y'all don't, if y'all don't think that my man is not off the rocker, I have not been able to confirm this, but I heard the first whispers yesterday and I started uh, doing some Google searching, but market rebellion on Twitter and some other people, and I don't know if it's circular reporting or not, are stating that Alexander uh, Tuyula, who is the deputy director general of Gazprom. Gazprom is the largest public listed national gas company in the world, and the largest company in the country of Russia by revenue was found dead aside yesterday in St. Petersburg. Hmm. That, that, right there is rich ass oligarchs pushing back like yo yo dog you're our fucking puppet we you're the rich businessman's fucking boy what you're doing right now is not good for fucking business you need to chill the fuck out and then the dog biting the hand that fucking feeds it again that's why i'm kind of like what you know, uh, w- at what point does this all fall apart? Because that could very well fall apart on his side. And what 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 is he paying the people that are around his inner circle to keep those people in line? Because there's always a bigger po- pocketbook. And some of those oligarchs rule fortunes that are uh, the equivalent of some small countries, uh, you know, GDP. Yeah. So uh, that that buys a lot of AKs. We've Whenever- all seen, yeah, we've all seen movies where you've got uh, the the evil, whether it's the evil Halliburton or whatever, and then you've got the corrupt politician. And at some point in the movie, the guy's so ruthless that the the Halliburton KBR rich dudes that are paying that guy in the back that he whacks them too, um, because at that point, absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, I don't know. The oligarchs, whenever Putin came to power, whenever Yeltsin ceded uh, ceded the presidency and 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 gave it to gave it to Putin, he wasn't voted in. Um, basically, within a few months, 
uh, Putin issued a directive to the oligarchs. You want to get involved in politics or you want to keep your money? What do you want? And uh, a couple of them kind of like, ha ha, whatever. And uh, they ended up having to haul ass out of the country. Uh, one of them got to spend a significant amount of time in, in, in prison because he started using his money to fund some political parties that would be uh, in competition with Putin. Uh, so the shot's already been given across their bow. Do you want to keep your money and stay alive or do you want to uh, uh, get involved in politics? Um, another thing that Putin has done that's really interesting is he's not only uh, used to, to great extent, he's weaponized uh, organized crime in Russia and basically has legitimated them and brought them into the folds of the uh, uh, security services, meaning FSB, KGB, GRU, SVR, name them. They, he's weaponized those guys. And what better, what better way to get, get into a country and know things, do things than organized crime? They know how to smuggle. They know how to do this. They know how to break sanctions. They know how to... I mean, they know how to do everything. He's he's definitely weaponized them, and that's something to to, to be considered. And also, hackers, uh, cyber cyber crime, uh, uh, cyber warfare, they're they're pretty good at it. Um, they like to say that they are better at it than anybody else on the planet. I've heard different stories. I don't know enough about it. Hell, I had a hard time, like I said, downloading Zoom to get this to work tonight, much less than I know much about hacking. But it's it's interesting also to take that into consideration, uh, uh, the, his, his use of uh, organized crime. Well, well, there was actually, uh, in eastern Ukraine, there was actually a, uh, a cell. And I wouldn't be surprised if we were, you know, looking over the shoulder of the Ukrainian intelligence service and our guys were passing off stuff to them as far as, hey, you might want to act on this. But there was a cell... Um, of uh, what was either Russian separatists or Ukrainian quote unquote ethnic Russians or absolute Russian organized crime members that were balled up, um, basically using the cover of quote unquote robberies, but uh, that they were going to stage on infrastructure uh, sites within Ukraine uh, under the guise of them being robberies. But you, when you, you they showed photos of the the packaging and it's all you know like. Semtex and C4 and all the other stuff or whatever the Russian version of that is uh, to use as uh, saboteurs. So they were bowling up cell after cell after cell of either, you know, organized crime or Russian intelligence or, uh, you know, Russian separatists that were planning, you know, stuff on the DL to help shape the attack. So I don't know how much of that they got um, and how much of that, you know, how much are they were able to, to like blunt the effect of. Uh, but I, I don't doubt that we were giving them a, a, a leg up. And it sounds like the Ukrainians have made uh, significant uh, steps since Crimea in terms of their, uh, you know, their, their TTPs, SOPs to help kind of blunt some of the, the more, uh, the, the issues that they had with Crimea. Some of that's technological, um, yep. but it's at the same time that, that, I guess the hacker thing, again, is it's one of those assessments that's probably behind the TSA, TSI or TSSCI paywall uh, with respect to being able to look at those reports. And even then, that would be limited to, you know, your need to know basis regarding that kind of stuff. So it's kind of hard to gauge that from a normal ground level grunt side of things. But I mean, that, that kind of plays into the whole Russian playbook for the last 100, 120 years now or 100 years now. Uh, which they know that they don't have the force projection that they did pre fall of the Soviet Union. Um, so beyond the, the obvious, like ICBMs, it's not like they can park a carry group off a country and just lay waste. Uh, that being said, it, it definitely allows you another avenue to cause absolute havoc with your enemy. If you can, like, for example, I was wondering how long it was going to take uh, well, as soon as Elon Musk announced that, he was going to make Starlink a uh, priority to Ukraine, shift satellites over, and then start shipping out, you know, the Ukrainian uh, or the Starlink dishes to give them, you know, some form of communications. Uh, I was wondering how long it was going to be that Starlink was going to get, a, you know, a cyber attack and Chuck's internet was going to go tits up. I ordered, 
Chuck's got it, and I can't have let Chuck have something that I don't have. So because okay. Chuck got it and wasn't too popular with the wife, uh, but I haven't got mine yet. I, I don't know when I'm going to get mine. Um, it's still in beta in my area, so I'm waiting. I'm waiting for it to be greenlit, and then I'm going to get it because I'm uh, I'm sick of using uh, the local ISP. You know, ours sucks too. <laughs> so if you guys are uh, cyber um, security hacking like ignorant, completely ignorant about what capabilities are out there or whatever. Uh, yeah, Nicole, cyber curious. Uh, yeah, Nicole Perloth is a uh, reporter and she wrote a book uh, after interviewing lots and lots and lots of hackers. And the title of the book is called uh, um, uh, How They Tell Me the, the World Ends or How They Tell Me It All Ends. Uh, but she did... She went on the Lex Friedman podcast last week, and that two-hour interview is on YouTube on uh, the Lex Friedman uh, channel. And she talks about what, what a zero-day is, what a zero-day exploit is, uh, how there are brokers that buy zero-day exploits, how these things happened um, as far as how hackers evolved from just kind of doing it for fun and then going to companies and telling companies, we found a, a back door into your shit, a glitch in your whatever. And then the company's telling them, shut up. And if you mention this again, we'll send the lawyers after you to now those companies paying up to six figures for people that can find exploits and report them to, to the, the coders. Uh, she talks about iOS versus Android. Um, exploits. And she talks about how these hired guns are now being outsourced by governments to do these things and how initially they were being done for counter-terrorist purposes, but now, uh, or in the Middle East, they were being done for political opponent purposes. So they would a zero day exploit. The Saudi Royal family would buy a zero day exploit and they would put it onto a specific political dissident's phone to have full access to uh, that, that device. Uh, and and they, these are uh, clickless malware. This is remote attack, getting through your shit. You don't have to open an email. You don't have to click on a link uh, and then taking full control of your device to be able to turn on cameras um, monitor all data going in and out, search all of the drives, photos, like all, all of that full backdoor access to, to the, the device. And um, so it was a pretty, pretty interesting podcast. I'm only about uh, 45 minutes through it, but it really broke some stuff down that I knew about, um, but broke it down in, in a really, really good layman's terms. And it was out in open kind of open source. So uh, you guys. Is that Lex, Lex Friedman? Yeah, Lex Friedman. And the, the video uh, is called Nicole Pearl Roth, P-E-R-L-R-O-T-H, Cybersecurity and the Weapons of Cyber War. I just added the book to my Audible list, so I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna download it as soon as we're done here. Yep, yep. Sorry, on the Amazon checklist. Um, but Thanks for the yeah, man, I, I stumbled across it uh, on, on my my daily YouTube uh, search, and I started listening to it in the background. I'm like, man, this chick is explaining some really, really deep concepts in really, really easy to understand ways. Because she's not a hacker; she's a reporter, but she talked to a lot of hackers, hackers that were mercs, hackers that were uh, hired guns for the government. Um, and, and we're out, out, outsourced freelance. Um, and, uh, yeah. And it was pretty cool to have somebody put a number to it, like, you know, a zero day exploit for an Android device, uh, sold through a, uh, zero day broker on the dark web could be worth two two point five million $2.5 million. Uh, but if you sell them through a broker, you have to be silent. And that's why a lot of these hackers, they do shit for notoriety. They would rather 
uh, develop ex exploits uh, and then um, give them to the give them to the software people, the phone manufacturers and shit. And then once they patch the exploit, be able to come out and be like, I'm the one that found the zero day that caused iOS update number, whatever. So it's about the street cred. And when they work for the government, when they work for the Saudis, when they work for the intelligence services, if they open their mouth about the exploits they discover, it, it breaks them. So the money's better, but the notoriety, like it's, it's all shadow, shadow ops shit. So just a little bit of the culture of the mind of the hacking community. I met one professional hacker and talked to him. Uh, you guys might've heard me talk about it in a previous online somewhere, but he blacked out portions of Denver during a threat assessment on the power grid there. They told him that he could not get access through the Bluetooth uh, readers of the, the, part of the meters or whatever. And so he, he blacked out like a half million people uh, to show the power company that he did in fact have access because they did not believe that he had it. Uh, and that just, that dude was a weird dude. And so I'm um, hearing a lot of her stories about talking to hackers and I'm like, yeah, I could see that shit. Um, Cause the guy that I met was a weirdo weird dude. So anyway, um, back to uh, back to the war in Ukraine. Russian stock market opens in 43 minutes. Ruble's already trading at uh, 100.2700. 100 to the U.S. dollar. That's a pretty basically like a 20% drop since uh, last week at this time. Ow. <laughs> yeah. Not good. <laughs> so. Um... You know, we got to we have to put all this in, in in perspective that, you know, it took the United States a couple of weeks to take over all of Iraq. Uh, so just because we're going into day four and there's not a lot of red red space on the board, um, that doesn't mean that this is over. And this is the this is the thing about believing your own hype, believing your own propaganda, you know, th things like that, like you've got to. You got you guys got to put this into perspective. There's a lot of tactics, techniques, and procedures that have not been employed yet, like thermal barrack MLRS strikes into suburbs to gain a foothold in, a, in an urban environment. Uh, if they start turning skyscrapers into mini fortresses, uh, overwatching channelized, uh, you know mind wire obstacles on every avenue of approach into the city. And then when the Russian combat engineers go in there and try to reduce those obstacles, they start receiving volley missile fire from 26 story buildings. Uh, they're going to be able to say like, that was a legitimate military target. And we, we, so we, we rubbled that skyscraper uh, like that. That's absolutely going to be on the board. Um, and we haven't seen that level of destruction to, to, you know, civilian targets uh, and such yet uh we don't know what's on that huge ass convoy coming out of belarus um you know he could have shot some colonels that were in charge of of the s4 supply shop been like you are the worst logistics officer ever pow and got some other dude to fire up the fuel trucks and put a fire under people's asses and uh and there's a whole part of this war that is outside of the purview of our Monday morning quarterback and OSINT stuff that we got going on. We have no idea what is going on, you know, in between the Crimean bridge and the Eastern front and the link up of, of that in there. We don't know how far into the Donbass in the rural areas that they've been able to conduct open maneuver warfare. All we, all we're seeing is social media and uh, mainstream media videos coming out of urban areas. That's all we have eyes on. And uh, that war in the hinterland could be going very, very much different than what we're seeing. Uh, all the uh, rainbows and fucking unicorns that we're seeing coming out of uh, the Ukrainian social media. Also, if you're one of these people that hates the mainstream media and you don't watch any of it from any side, I have not seen anybody reporting other than Fox News 
that allegedly when we saw all of this stuff happening in terms of our national intelligence collection, that we provide that information to China. We gave them critical sterilized intelligence that showed indications of a strategic move to take Ukraine. And we asked the Chinese to leverage the Russians politically to prevent this crisis. And that not only did the Chinese tell us to eat a bag of dicks, uh, and that they were uh, not going to interfere with the Russians' uh, plans, but they gave our sterilized intelligence of what we knew about Russia's plans over to the Russians. So a complete diplomatic failure in terms of a calculated risk of, is this other nation going to be a political adversary or, or ally? We completely misjudged the level of complicity between Russia and China, and ba- it'd be like it'd be like going to the Axis powers and telling them we knew some shit was going on with Hitler. Japan, can you please try to interject and and prevent Hitler from taking fucking Czechoslovakia? Yeah, sure, bro. We'll get right on that. Yo, Hitler, they totally know you're about to roll Czechoslovakia <laughs> like that. What the fuck, man? And it's not being covered by anybody else other than other than Fox News that I've seen. I I have not seen it uh, being re replayed on other kind of more independent media. So take that. Uh, yeah, wh- where what are Laura Ingrams and the other guys on Fox? What are their sources that are saying that? I I, I don't know. But uh, so I'm just regurgitating that for anybody that doesn't doesn't watch Fox News. Fuck Fox News. Fuck MSNBC. Well. There, there's reporting that I'm only seeing on Fox. Now you know that that's out there. You can go do your Google searching and find it, fi- find the source reporting on, on that. Because you know that's just a soundbite for the Fox people. They didn't come up with that shit on their own. So true. You know, I think that actually might have been a wonderful closing statement. And what we can do is we can regroup in a few days if we want. Sure. See if there's more to discuss. See yeah. how things develop. Absolutely. Be happy to. Yeah, I appreciate it. So before you guys take off, one moment. Make sure you guys are supporting those sources that you found to be beneficial. Uh, these guys are going to tell you where they can be found possibly, uh, who they represent, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we are greatly outnumbered when it comes to, well, you know, that whole algorithm thing. We talk about it regularly. All the, all of our good sources, all of our great friends don't have the following that the channels that are a little bit more entertainment oriented have. So make sure you guys, make sure the listeners, viewers, supporters, make sure you're given likes, subscriptions, follows, shares, all that kind of stuff, because it helps everyone. So with that in mind, let's go to Chuck for some final thoughts and he plugs of whatever you want to plug. Yeah. You know, it's, especially in the vet bro culture and everything, it's, it's really easy to put on, get out your pom poms and, and uh, jump into all this. I know that on the first night I was riveted by, by it, uh, it took me all the way back to the invasion of Iraq um, and uh, and and battle tracking and switching channels and glued to to the the thing just out of an insatiable desire to to know what's going on. Uh, I've matured a bit since then, and that's why I have not been on my patreon or on social media th- thus far to kind of pundit about this because we 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 bet the only thing that we should know is that we don't know shit. And, um, and so, you know, I've got some gut feelings. I've got some stuff that, I, that I'm seeing, like I said, you know, it took a lot for me to go out and like call somebody a madman. It's, and it's easy to, to write off any dictator as a madman, but, but to legitimately say, like, I think this guy is exhibiting, paranoid delusional behavior and now there there are statesmen uh and politicians that have dealt with this person diplomatically that are that are sharing that opinion um 
so I didn't just come up with that on my own. Uh, but that being said, like, I, I know that when you put stuff out on social media, you have a responsibility to own it. If people are taking what you're saying at face value, uh, especially if they're making decisions about it or whatever. And so I, I want to preface all this. This is a bunch of guys, a dude that speaks Russian, a dude that just came from the fucking Polish border and, and, uh, and, a, and a long, a long time, uh, D- DOD guy that that's that's seen seen some wars uh, and some politics and and their their intersection with one another and we're just sharing our opinion for your entertainment value. This is not a refined intelligence assessment. This is not open source intelligence assessment. This is a bunch of dudes that have known each other for a while, sitting around and having a discussion about world events, <coughs> and inviting you guys into that discussion. Take that for what it is worth um, and what you paid for it. Um, that being said, I have discussions uh, about whatever you guys want to know about uh, uh, my opinion of on my Patreon. I do that behind the paywall so that my, my stuff is not being forwarded and sent out to people that have no idea who I am and want to throw in their two cents about my opinion. Dude, I don't know you. I don't, I don't care about your opinion about my opinion. Um, so I, I, I spend time, uh, answering questions and, uh, supporting people that, su- that, that support me and, and our, our network of, of, uh, people. So, uh, if you found, if you've never heard me before, I don't know how that's possible, but if you've never heard me before and you happen to be on here and you're compelled to, to listen to what else I have to think about what else, uh, then come find me on my Patreon, um, Patreon, uh, dot com forward slash press check consulting. You can sign on for a buck and have full access to everything. If you think that you listen to more than a dollar's worth of content and you want to contribute more, that's great, but you're not going to get any more access than that. I want, I don't want your financial means to restrict your access to, uh, the answer that you might be looking for. So, um, that's uh that's all i got to say about that uh my website presstrackconsulting.com has my current calendar of all the places that i'm going to be conducting closed and open enrollment uh training spring training season's about to kick off in earnest so got some uh shoot house uh safety courses out there in april and june and uh alliance and uh um Blue Force Gear Joint Training Facility in Savannah. So that'll be a three-day POI that I haven't done before, basically talking about how the sausage is made, how to safely conduct shoot house training. And uh, the, the vessel for that is to teach basic uh, shoot house stuff and then peer evaluate. So you go through the run as a doer, and then you go up on the catwalk and you observe and you see where targets are placed, how floor plans are created uh, so that the scenario of the house is driving the building block learning approach of, uh, of learning CQB. And the methodology is standard battle drill six alpha. Uh, so no, no secret squirrel ninja flip tactics or anything like that. Then obviously there's always no fail pistol, no fail rifle and night vision courses sprinkled out around the country during the next year. So go check those out. If you, uh, if you want to come train with me, thanks for the uh, invite, Matt. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Matt, do you have anything you want to plug any pages, any, any final thoughts? Nope. Uh, I kind of jumped in a little bit late to the conversation. Uh, I appreciate uh, this. Is, I think the first time I've, I've talked to Yancey, a uh, long time social media contact and we haven't really interacted, but uh no Chuck for a while, but uh, beyond that, um, I'm just a dude uh, that by virtue of being kind of close to that region had a little bit of an opinion on it. Uh, it's kind of like Chuck said, the old yield disclaimer, I am not an Intel analyst in any shape or form. Um, this is just our kind of read with having been involved in conflicts that have had a heavy dose of politics interwoven in them and seeing the consequence of those politics be immediately, you know, on the receiving end for the ground level grunt. Um, 
so I, you know, I kind of, I always pay attention to that stuff just because I've seen how much it can affect, you know, your operations on the ground. Um, it kind of a forecasting for me, like, okay, where, where's my next, either where's my next fight or where are the next operational snags? Um, so nobody special, um, just kind of had a, at least a, a relatively unique position. Um, but that's about it. Um, I, I'm, I'm just a working stiff, so I don't have a training company or a website or anything else like that to, to post up, but just for the betterment of the betterment of the community. Cool. Thanks for joining us. And yeah, it, it was, a long it, time. good call. I it was, I think it was Chuck that even said we need to get mech here. Yeah, it's, uh, I've been watching this with uh, a lot of interest. Um, I haven't had the, just cause I, I just got back moving into my house again, getting ready to start working again next week. So it's, uh, it's been a bit of a, uh, trying to balance relaxation with, uh, stuff I've had to do. Um, so I was, uh, <laughs> I was literally rolling over the past when this invite came in. So I uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Yancy, what do you have? Plugs, final uh, thoughts. I don't have anything to. I don't have anything to to pimp. Um, uh, definitely, uh, I've known Chuck for a very long time. We go way back to the old light fighter days, you know. And um, uh, I'm glad to glad to see this training company is truly like out there putting out some good stuff. And one of these days, Chuck, I'll come take your class. I promise you, man. Um, but uh, no, it's just, I just think uh, one thing I have to say is the the next. Uh, I don't even want to say hours, but I want to say the next few days is something to definitely follow. Uh, Chuck is giving me a whole page here full of stuff to follow up on and take a look at. So the next time we meet up again, we'll have some more information. But uh, this has definitely been a, a very interesting discussion. I thank you for uh, letting me come here. You, As a matter of fact, I think it was uh, Chad Mercer said, we need to get Yancey. And I thought, yes, we do. Great, great suggestion. <laughs> I'm actually a little surprised he didn't want to jump in on the conversation, but no, oh well, maybe next he's, time. He's probably taking notes. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, thanks to, thanks to the panelists. Thanks for you, the listener or viewer. Uh, also a big thank you to our sponsors. Again, support those sources that you found to be beneficial. If you like what Chuck has to say, if you, if you like what uh, Blowers, Freeborn, you name it, any of our friends, make sure you find them, make sure you follow, make sure you share, uh, recommend them to others. And that goes for primary and secondary as well. If you haven't already, make sure you have given this a like. We've been doing this now. Let's see here. What are we at? Three hours, three and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you dedicated that much time to this discussion, you should, you should be giving this a like. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, Big Tech's Ordinance. Filster, Primary Arms, Staccato, Walther, and lastly, huge thank you to our Patreon subscribers. If you go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary, you can help support the network. There's a lot of stuff that primary and secondary provides for free, but unfortunately, it is not for free to provide it. So that's where the Patreon support comes in and helps pay all bunch of bills. Uh, we do, we have been discussing a potential episode tomorrow talking about more cop stuff we'll probably get into some more case law uh, that will most likely be tomorrow night that will be monday and because today's sunday and i don't remember what case we were going to talk about but it's okay so that's all i'm gonna kill the feed now so i can edit it so i'll talk to you guys later cheers <laughs>